the girl next door by augusta yule seaman chapter one marcia's secret marcia brett do you mean to tell me tell you what that you have had a secret for two whole months and never told me about it and i am your best friend i was waiting until you came to the city janet i wanted to tell you i didn't want to write it well i have been in the city for twelve hours and you never said a word about it until just now but janet we've been sightseeing ever since you arrived you can't very well tell secrets when you're sightseeing you know well you might have given me a hint about it long ago you know we've solemnly promised never to have any secrets from each other and yet you've had one for two whole months no janet i haven't had it quite as long as that honest it didn't begin until quite after i came in fact not until about three or four weeks ago tell me all about it right away then and perhaps i'll forgive you the two girls cuddled up close to each other on the low couch by the open window and lowered their voices to a whisper through the warm darkness of the june night came the hum of the great city a subdued murmurous sound strangely unfamiliar to one of the girls who was in the city for the first time in all of her country life to the other the sound had some time since become an accustomed one as they leaned their elbows on the sill and chins in hand stared out into the darkness marcia began well jan i might as well commence at the beginning so you'll understand how it all happened i've been just crazy to tell you but i am not good at letter writing and there is such a lot to explain that i thought i'd wait till your visit you know when we first moved to this apartment last april from way back in northam i was all excitement for a while just to be living in the city everything was so different really i acted so silly you wouldn't believe it i used to run down to the front door half a dozen times a day just to push the bell to see the door open all by itself it seemed like something in a fairy tale for the longest while i couldn't get used to the dumb waiter or the steam heat or the electric lights and all of that sort of thing it is awfully different from our old-fashioned little northam now isn't it yes i feel just that way this minute admitted janet and then too went on marcia there were all the things outside to do and see the trolleys and stores and parks and museums and the zoo aunt minerva said i went around like a distracted chicken for a while and besides that we used to have the greatest fun shopping for new furniture and things for this apartment hardly a bit of that big old furniture we brought with us would fit into it these rooms are so much smaller than the ones in our old farmhouse well anyhow for a while i was too busy and interested and excited to think of another thing yes too busy to even write to me interrupted janet i had about one letter in two weeks from you those days and you promised to write every other day oh well never mind that now you'd have done the same i guess if you don't let me go on i'll never get to the secret after a while though i got used to all the new things and i had seen the sights and aunt minerva had finished all of the furnishings except the curtains and draperies she's at that yet and all of a sudden everything fell flat i hadn't begun my music lessons and there didn't seem to be a thing to do or a single interest in life the truth is janet i was frightfully lonesome for you here marcia felt her hand squeezed in the darkness perhaps you don't realize it but living in an apartment in a big city is the queerest thing you don't know your neighbor that lives right across the hall you don't know a soul in the house and as far as i can see you're not likely to if you lived here fifty years nobody calls on you as they do a new family in the country nobody seems to care a rap who you are and whether you live or die or anything and wouldn't you believe it janet there isn't another girl in this whole apartment either older or younger than myself no one but grown-ups so you can see how awfully lonesome i've been and as aunt minerva had decided not to send me to high school till fall i didn't have a chance to get acquainted with anyone my own age actually it got so i didn't do much else but moon around and mark off the days till the school in northam closed and you could come and oh i am so glad that you're here for the summer isn't it gorgeous she hugged her chum spasmodically but to go on i'm telling you this so you can see what led up to my doing what i did about the secret it began one awfully rainy afternoon last month 
I had been for a walk in the wet, just for exercise, and when I came in, Aunt Minerva was out shopping. I hadn't a new book to read, nor a blessed thing to do, so I just sat down right here by the window and got to thinking and wondering why things were so unevenly divided, why you, Jan, should have a mother and a father and a big, jolly lot of brothers and sisters, and I should be just one, all alone, living with Aunt Minerva, though she's lovely to me, with no mother and a father away nearly all the time on his ship. And it seemed as if I just hated this apartment with its little rooms like cubby holes all in a row. I longed to be back in Northam, and I even thought I'd give anything to live in that big, rambling, dingy old place next door, beyond the brick wall, for at least one could go up and down stairs to different rooms. Then, if you believe me, Jan, as I stared at the house, it began to dawn on me that I'd never really taken it in before that it was a very strange-looking old place, and because I didn't have another mortal thing to do, I just sat and stared at it as if I had never seen it before, and began to wonder and wonder about it, for there were a number of things about it that seemed decidedly queer. "'What's it like, anyway?' questioned Janet. "'There were so many other things to see today that I didn't notice it at all, and it's so dark now I can't see a thing. Why, it's a big, square, four-story brick house.' and it's terribly in need of paint. It looks like it hasn't had a coat in years and years. It stands way back from the street, in a sort of ragged, weedy garden, and there's a high brick wall around the whole place, except for the heavy wooden gate at the front, covered with ironwork. That gate is always closed. The stone walk runs from the gate to the front door. Way back around the rear of the garden is an old brick stable that looks as if it hadn't been opened or used in years. You'll see all of this for yourself, Janet, when you look out the window in the morning, for this apartment house runs along close to the brick wall, and, as we're three floors up, you'll get a good view of the whole place. This window in my room is the very best place of all to see it, fortunately. But the queer thing about it is that, though the shutters are tightly closed or bowed, every one, and the whole place looks deserted, it really isn't. There's someone living in it, and once in a while you happen to see signs of it. For instance, that very afternoon I saw this. Most of the shutters were tightly closed, but on the second floor they are usually just bowed. And that day the slats of one of them were open, and I thought I could see a muslin curtain flapping behind it. But while I was looking, the fingers of a hand suddenly appeared between the slats and snapped them shut with a jerk. Of course, there's nothing so awfully strange about a thing like that as a rule, but somehow the way it was done seemed mysterious. I can't explain just why. Anyhow, as I hadn't a thing else to do, I concluded I'd sit there for a while longer and see if something would happen. But nothing did, not for nearly an hour, and I was getting tired of the thing and just going to get up and go away when... What? breathed Janet in an excited whisper. The big front door opened, it was nearly dark by that time, and out crept the queerest little figure. It appeared to be a little old woman, all dressed in dingy black clothes that looked as though they must have come out of the ark. They were so old-fashioned. Her hat was a queer little bonnet, with no trimming except a heavy black veil that came down over her face. She had a small market basket on her arm and a big old umbrella. But the queerest thing was the way she scuttled down the path to the gate, like a frightened rabbit, turning her head side to side as if she was afraid of being seen or watched. When she got to the gate, she had to put down the basket and the umbrella and use both hands to unlock it with a huge key. When she got outside of it, on the street, she shut the gate behind her, and of course I couldn't see her any more. Well, it set me to wondering and wondering what the story of that queer old house and queer old lady could be. It seemed as if there must be some sort of story about it, or some explanation, for you see, it's a big place, and evidently at one time must have been very handsome, and it stands right here in one of the busiest and most valuable parts of the city. The more I thought about it, the more curious I grew. But the worst of it was that I didn't know a soul who could tell me the least thing about it. Aunt Minerva couldn't, of course, and I wasn't acquainted with another person in the city. It just seemed as if I must find some explanation. Then, all of a sudden, I thought of our new colored maid. Perhaps she might have heard something about it. I made up my mind to go right out to the kitchen. So I went and started her talking about things in general, 
and finally asked her if she knew anything about the old house. And then, I wish you could have heard her. I can't tell it all the way she did, but this is the substance of it. It seems that she discovered that the janitor here is the son of an old friend from North Carolina. Of course, she's been talking to him a lot, and he has told her all about the whole neighborhood, especially about the queer old house next door. He says it is known all around here as Benedict's Folly. Why? queried Janet. Well, years and years ago, when the owner built it, his name was Benedict, it was way out of the city limits, and everybody thought he was awfully foolish going so far and building a handsome city house off in the wilderness. But he wasn't so foolish after all, for the city came right up and surrounded him in the end, and the property is worth no end of money now. But here's the queer thing about it. Old Mr. Benedict's been dead many years, and the place looks as if no one lived there, but someone does. It's the daughter of his, a queer little old lady who keeps herself shut up there all the time. Some think she's alone, others say no, and someone else is there with her. No one seems to know definitely. Anyhow, although she is very wealthy, she does all the work herself and the marketing and she even carries home all the things and won't allow a single one of the tradesmen to come in. Mr. Simmons, that's our janitor, says that two years ago in the winter, a water pipe there burst, and Miss Benedict just had to get a plumber, and he afterward told awfully peculiar things about the way the house looked, the furniture all draped and covered up, and even the pictures on the wall covered too, and not a single modern improvement, except the running water and some old-fashioned gas fixtures. And the little old lady never raised her veil while he was there, so he couldn't see what she looked like. Mr. Simmons says that everyone thinks that there is some great mystery about Benedict's folly, but no one seems to be able to guess what it can be. Now, Janet, isn't that just fascinating? think of living next door to a mystery it's simply thrilling sighed janet but marcia i don't see what this has to do with a secret where do you come in i don't see why you couldn't have written all of this to me wait said marcia i haven't finished yet that was absolutely all that i could get out of our maid eliza all she or anyone else knew in fact but as you can imagine i couldn't get the thing out of my mind and i couldn't stop looking at the place either i tried to talk to aunt minerva about it she wasn't a bit interested she said she couldn't understand how anyone could keep a house in that slovenly fashion and that's all she would say so i gave up trying to interest her now i must tell you the odd thing that happened that very night you know i've said it was raining hard all that day and by ten o'clock the wind was blowing a gale i was just ready for bed and had turned off my light and raised the shade when i thought i'd take another peep at my mysterious mansion across the fence all i could see however were just some streaks of light through the chinks in the shutters and the one room on the second floor all of the rest of the place was as dark as a pocket and as I sat staring out, it suddenly came to me what fun it would be to try to unravel the whole mysterious affair all by myself. It would certainly help me pass the dull days till you came. But then, too, the only way I could do it would be to watch this old place like a cat, and I knew that wouldn't be right. It would be too much like spying on your neighbor's affairs, and of course that's horrid. Finally, I concluded that I could do it without being meddlesome or prying. I'd just watch the place a little and see if anything interesting would happen. And while I was thinking this, a strange thing did happen that very minute. The wind had grown terrific, and all of a sudden it just took one of the shutters in that lighted room and ripped it from its fastening, and it threw it back against the wall. And the next moment a figure hurried to the window, leaned out, and drew the shutter back in place again. But just for one instant, I had caught a glimpse of the whole inside of the room. And what do you suppose I saw, Jan? What? demanded Janet. Well, not much of the furnishings except a lighted oil lamp on the table, but directly in the center of the room in a perfectly enormous armchair sat, 
a woman and it wasn't the one that i had seen in the afternoon either i'm sure of that i couldn't see her face for it was in shadow but she was looking down at something spread out on her lap and she held her right hand over it in the air and waved it back and forth sort of uncertainly you can't imagine what a strange picture it was and then the shutter was closed there was just something so weird about it if i was curious before i was simply wild with interest then it seemed as if i must know what it all meant what that strange old lady could be doing sitting there in state in the middle of the room and all the rest of it you don't blame me do you jan indeed i don't i'd be ten times worse i guess but what about the secret and did you find out anything else yes i did and that's the secret the whole mysterious thing is the secret because no one but you knows that i am the least interested in the affair and i don't want them to now i'll tell you what happened next but just at this moment the girls were interrupted by a knock at their door and a voice inquiring girls girls haven't you gone to bed yet i heard you talking for the last hour no aunt minerva answered marcia we're sitting by the window well you must go to bed at once it's nearly midnight you won't either of you be fit for a thing tomorrow. now mind not another word good night good night they both answered but heaved a sigh when aunt minerva was out of hearing it's no use whispered marcia we'll have to stop for tonight but there's a lot more and the most interesting part of it too well never mind i'll tell you all the rest tomorrow end of chapter one marcia's secret chapter two of the girl next door the face behind the shutter janet had no sooner hopped out of bed the next morning than she flew to the window to examine benedict's folly by broad daylight in the streaming sun of a june morning the dingy old mansion certainly bore out the truth of marcia's mysterious description gracious i should think that you would have been interested in it from the first she exclaimed interested in what yawned marcia sleepily opening her eyes benedict's folly of course let's see went on janet who possessed a very practical orderly mind from your story last night it seems that there must be two people living there but look here how did you know marcia that it was another old lady that you saw that night when the shutter blew open why for several reasons answered marcia in the first place the one who goes out is short and slight the one sitting in the chair is evidently large and rather stout and and different somehow although i didn't see either of their faces and then it wasn't the lady in the chair who closed the shutter she evidently never moved so it must have been someone else yes it must have been agreed janet convinced queer that nobody seems to know about the second one i wonder who she is and are there any more go on with your story marcia no said marcia wait till we can be by ourselves for a long while i don't want to be interrupted aunt minerva's going out this morning and then we'll have a chance so later in the morning the two girls sat by marcia's window each occupied with a dainty bit of embroidery and marcia began anew well after that rainy night for several days i didn't see a thing more that was interesting about the old house or the queer people who lived in it i used to watch once in a while to see if the little old lady in black would go out again in the afternoon as she did before but she didn't then a day or two later i did something that surprised even myself for i hadn't the faintest intention of doing it i had been taking a walk that afternoon and i was just coming home passing on the way the high brick wall of the benedict house it was just as i reached the closed gate that an idea popped into my head you know they say that no visitors are ever admitted and no rings or knocks at the gate are ever answered well something suddenly prompted me to ring that bell and see what would happen i never stopped to ask myself what i should say if someone came and inquired what i wanted i just rang it suddenly and i had to pull hard the old thing was so rusty and far away somewhere in the house i heard a faint tinkle then i got kind of panic-stricken wondering what i'd say if anyone really did come 
but i needn't have worried for what do you suppose happened nothing answered janet promptly that's just where you're mistaken but you'd never guess what it was about a minute after i rung the bell i heard light footsteps on the walk behind the gate but instead of coming toward the gate they were hurrying away from it and in another minute i heard the front door close after that all was quiet and nothing else happened then i went on home i know interrupted janet whose quick mind had already worked out the problem exactly what occurred it was miss benedict who had just been about to come out on her way to do the marketing and your ring frightened her and sent her hurrying back into the house isn't it all singular yes it must have been agreed marcia and it made me more curious than ever to understand about it and i was so annoyed at myself for ringing at all if i hadn't i might have seen miss benedict close by when she came out of the gate it serves me right for doing such a thing anyhow but after that i got to watching every time i went out thinking that i might see her on the street somewhere especially if it was about the time that she usually did her marketing along towards dusk several days passed however and i never did i had a thought of watching from my window to see when she went out and then following her but that didn't seem right somehow it would be too much like spying on her so i just concluded that i'd trust to chance and luck favored me at last one morning about a week after i had rung her bell it happened that night before eliza suddenly discovered that we were all out of oatmeal for breakfast and i promised her i'd get some very early in the morning when i went to take my walk you know i have found that on these warm summer days in the city it is much pleasanter to take a walk in the real early morning than to wait till later in the day when it is hot and crowded and i always used to love walking in the early morning up in northam well anyhow i got up that day about six i knew that no stores near here would be open so early and i decided to walk over towards the other side of town it's sort of a poor section there and the stores often open up quite early so that folks can do their marketing before they go to work it was a beautiful cool morning and i was quite enjoying myself when jan what do you think i looked up and about a half a block ahead of me was a little black figure with a market basket hurrying along i knew it was miss benedict can you imagine my surprise and delight i suddenly made up my mind to keep behind her and go into the same store as she did there could surely be no harm in that and by and by i saw her turn into a little grocery shop a minute or two after and i walked went to the counter and stood right near her there was no one in the store besides ourselves and the grocer he looked sleepy and was yawning while he wrapped up something for her he asked me to wait a minute please which of course i was only too delighted to do for it gave me perfect right to stand close to my mysterious little neighbor and hear her speak and it was right there janet that i got the surprise of my life she still wore her black veil and it was so thick that not a bit of her face could be seen her dress was the most old-fashioned thing it looked twenty years old if not more but i don't know what sort of voice i expected to hear but it was nothing in the least of what i did hear i can't exactly describe it to you jan but it was the most beautiful speaking voice i have ever heard in my life it was soft and flute-like and oh so so appealing it somehow went straight to my heart it made me feel as if i wanted to take care of miss benedict somehow i can't exactly explain it even when she was speaking of such commonplace things as butter and eggs and sugar it was like like music well in a few minutes she had finished and the grocer packed her things in her basket and away she went i had to stay of course and get my oatmeal and i didn't see her again but being so close to her and hearing that lovely voice had changed my whole feeling about her at first i had just been interested and awfully curious about the whole mysterious affair and i'll confess just a wee bit repelled by the account of the queer little lady and the strange way she lived i wanted to know the explanation of the mystery but i didn't particularly want to know her but after that i felt different sort of bewitched by that beautiful voice i wanted to help that miss benedict i wanted to do something for her or to try to make her happier or 
or something i couldn't quite explain what and i wanted oh so much to see her face and to know what she was like and more about herself can you understand jan indeed i can but do go on did you ever meet her again no i didn't but i've seen and heard something else that's strange more strange than all the rest tell me quick demanded janet two nights ago i sat here by the window it was too hot to turn on the light but it was very dark outside presently i heard footsteps in the benedict garden they were light quick footsteps and sounded exactly as if someone were running about or skipping and jumping first i thought it must be a big dog for it couldn't possibly have been either one of those two old ladies running and skipping that way and then i heard a soft humming as if someone were singing a tune half under the breath and then very soon after a door opened and a voice called out very softly come in now and after that all was quiet now janet mcneil i am simply positive that there is someone else in that house beside the two old ladies someone who hasn't been seen yet what do you make of it you must be right replied janet thoughtfully it couldn't be either of them running about in the garden in the dark and humming a tune it isn't at all what they'd likely to do i think that it must be someone else more more human and natural somehow and younger too but what on earth do they all keep so shut up for and act as if they were afraid to be seen it's the queerest thing i've ever heard of you certainly have moved next door to a dark brown mystery marcia for the ensuing hour the girls embroidered steadily and discussed benedict's folly and its inmates and all their peculiar phases but turn and twist it as they might they could find no answer to the riddle after a while janet changed the subject by the way marcia how are you coming on with your violin practice have you begun taking lessons here yet you know that was one of the principal things you folks moved to the city for so that you could study with the best teachers yes i've begun with professor hardwick said marcia i've practiced quite hard lately it's about all i've had to do he says i've made some progress already oh do get your violin and play some for me begged janet i am starving for some good music i haven't heard any since you left northam so marcia obligingly went to the parlor and brought back her violin when she had tuned it and tucked it lovingly under her chin she sat down at the window seat and ran her bow over the strings in a shower of liquid melody for one so young she played astonishingly well janet listened breathless absorbed marcia dear you have improved she exclaimed as her chum stopped for a moment now do play my favorite marcia laid her bow on the strings once more and slipped into a tender reverie of the trois but before it was finished Janet, wide-eyed with astonishment, laid her hand on Marcia's arm. Look, she breathed. Marcia followed the direction of her gaze and turned to stare out the window at the house opposite. And this is what she saw. The shutter of the window on the top floor had been pushed partially open and a face looked out, a face with big, appealing eyes and a frame of golden, curling hair falling all about it straight over at the two in the window it gazed eager absorbed delighted and then suddenly as it detected their own interested stare it withdrew and the shutter was softly closed the two girls drew a long breath and gazed at each other janet what did i tell you there is someone else in that house cried marcia i guess you're right admitted janet quieter but no less excited but do you realize who that third person is marcia brett it isn't an old lady it is someone just about our own age it's a young girl end of chapter two the face behind the shutter chapter three of the girl next door the gate opens for the two ensuing days marcia and janet tense with excitement discussed the most recently discovered inmate of benedict's folly and watched incessantly for another glimpse of the face behind the shutter how was it they constantly demanded of each other 
that a girl of fourteen or fifteen had come to be shut up in that dreary old place was she a prisoner there was she a relative friend or servant was she free to come and go to the latter question they ununanimously voted no how could she be aught else but a prisoner when she was never seen going in or out was forced to take her exercise after nightfall in the dark garden and was kept constantly behind closed shutters no girl of that age in her right mind could deliberately choose a life like that do you suppose that she has always lived there queried marcia for the twentieth time and as janet could answer it no better than herself she propounded another question and why do you suppose she opened the shutter and looked out seeming so delighted when i played and then drew in so quickly when we noticed her is she afraid of being seen too evidently said janet she must be as full of mystery as the rest of them and yet i can't somehow feel that she is like them she's so sweet and young and oh you know what i mean of course she knew but it didn't help them in the least to solve this latest phase of their mystery finally marcia who still clung a bit shyly to the fairy lore of her earlier years declared i believe she's a regular cinderella kept there to do all the hard work of the place by those two queer old ladies and i shouldn't be a bit surprised if she is down in the kitchen this minute cleaning out the ashes of the stove come jan let's go for a walk and when we come back i'll play the violin by the window maybe our little cinderella will peep out again the two girls put on their hats and strolled out for their usual afternoon walk and treat of ice cream soda but they had gone no further from their own door than the length of the benedict brick wall when they were suddenly brought to a halt in front of the closed gate by hearing a sound on the other side of it it was a sound indicative of someone's struggling attempt to open it the click of the key turning and turning in the lock and the futile rattling of the iron knob and then the sound of a voice murmuring oh dear what shall i do i can't get this open janet whispered marcia that's not the voice of miss benedict i know it i believe it's cinderella and she's trying to run away what shall we do stay here no janet whispered back let's just stroll on a little way and then turn back we can see what happens then without seeming to be watching they walked on quietly for a number of yards and then turned to approach the gate again even as they did so they saw it open and out stepped a little figure it was not miss benedict the slim trim little girlish form was clad in plain dark clothes of a slightly unfamiliar cut but the face was the one that had appeared in the upper window and the thick golden curls were surmounted by a black velvet tam o shanter on her arm she carried a small market basket and her eyes had a bewildered almost frightened look in their excited interest marcia and janet had quite unconsciously stopped short of where they were and waited to see which way their cinderella would turn but though they stood for an appreciable moment she turned neither way and only stood her back to the gate gazing uncertainly to the right and left and then perceiving them she seemed to take a sudden resolution and turn to them appealingly oh please could you direct me how to find this she asked holding out a slip of paper marcia hurried to her side and read the written address and when she had read it she realized it was the little grocery shop on the other side of town where she had once encountered miss benedict why certainly she cried you walk over five blocks in that direction then you turn to your left and down three you can't miss it it's right next to the shoemaker's place the child looked more bewildered than ever and her eyes strayed to the busy street crossing near which they stood crowded with hurrying trucks and automobiles thank you she faltered do i go this way and then with sudden candor you see i'm strange in these streets her voice was pretty and clear but her accent markedly un-american both girls half consciously noted it see here said marcia would you care to have us take you there we're not going in any special direction and i've been there before an infinitely relieved expression came over the girl's face oh would you be so kind i'm just just scattered out on these streets they turned to accompany her one on each side and piloted her safely across the busy avenue 
then in the quiet stretch of the next block they proceeded together in complete and embarrassing silence it was a silence that marcia and janet had fully expected their companion to break possibly to reveal some reason for her errand and her strangeness in the streets they themselves hesitated to say much for fear of seeming curious or anxious to force her confidence but she said not a word the strain at last became too much for janet i don't blame you for feeling nervous in these city streets she began i'm a country girl myself and i act like a scared rabbit whenever i go out alone here the girl turned to her with a little confiding gesture i've never been out on them alone before she said then there was another silence during which marcia and janet both searched frantically in their minds for something else to say but it was the girl herself who broke the silence the second time thank you for your music the other day she said turning to marcia i heard you i often hear you and listen oh i'm so glad you liked it cried marcia do you care for music i adore it she said simply look here exclaimed marcia suddenly how did you know that it was i that played the violin because i've watched you often through the slats marcia and janet exchanged glances so the watching was not all on their side of the fence here was a revelation the last thing you played the other day will you will you tell me what it was went on their new companion shyly why it was schumann's troy Murray, answered marcia i love it don't you yes but i never heard it before that is i never remember hearing it and yet somehow i seem to know it i can't think why i don't understand it was as if i dreamed it i think marcia and janet again exchanged glances what a strange child this was who talked of having dreamed music that was quite familiar to almost everyone perhaps you heard it at a concert suggested janet i never went to a concert she replied much to their amazement and then perceiving their surprise she added you see i've always lived way off in the country in just a little village till now oh yes answered janet pretending enlightenment though in truth she and marcia were more bewildered than ever by this time they had reached the little grocery shop and all proceeded inside while their new friend made her purchases these she read off slowly from a slip of paper and the grocer packed them in her basket but when it came to paying for them and making change she became entangled in a fresh puzzle i think you said these eggs were a shilling she ventured to the grocer shilling no i said they were a quarter he retorted impatiently a quarter she queried and then turned questioning eyes to her two friends he means this said marcia picking up the twenty-five cent piece from the change that the girl held oh thank you i don't understand this american money she explained and marcia and janet added another query to the rapidly growing mental list on the way back home however she grew silent again and though the girls chatted back and forth about quite impersonal matters the crowded streets the warm weather the sights they passed she was not to be drawn into the conversation and nearer they drew to their destination the more depressed she appeared to become at last they reached the gate shall you be going out again to-morrow ventured marcia if so we'll go with you if you care to have us till you get used to the streets the girl gave a sudden pleased glance i i don't know she said you see miss benedict hurt her ankle a day or two ago and she can't get around much so so i'm doing this for her if she wants me to go to-morrow i will i'd be so glad to go with you how shall i let you know just hang a white handkerchief to your shutter before you go and we'll see it we'll watch for it cried marcia inventing the signal on the spur of the moment and then impetuously she added my name is marcia brett and this is janet mcneil won't you tell us yours if we're to be friends i'm cicely marlowe she answered and i am so glad to know you as she spoke she was fumbling with the big key in the lock of the gate as the latter swung open she turned once more to face them with a little pent-up sob i don't know why i'm here and i'm so lonely then frightened for having revealed so much she turned quickly away and shut the gate as they listened to her footsteps retreating up the path and the closing of the front door marcia and janet turned to each other 
a thousand questions burning on their tongues but all they could exclaim in one breath was did you ever end of chapter three the gate opens chapter four of the girl next door the backwards glance the next twenty-four hours were spent in delightful speculation so her name was cicely marlowe was she any relation of miss benedict marlowe and benedict were certainly dissimilar enough then she might be a relation on miss benedict's mother's side suggested marcia does it sound likely when you think of what she said just at the last that she didn't know why she was there replied janet scornfully she couldn't be in doubt about it if she were a relation either come on a visit or there to stay which argument settled that question but where do you suppose she has come from marveled marcia she said that she has always lived in a little country village and she didn't know a thing about american money she's foreign that's certain even her clothes and the way of speaking show it but from where did you notice that she said shilling suggested janet that shows that she must be english she looks english now will you tell me how she got way over here from england and not know why she had come it sounds as if she might have been kidnapped said marcia why janet this is precisely like a mystery in a book do you realize it and here we are living right next door to it it's too good to be true janet's mind had however gone off on another tack i can't understand that remark she made about the music trauma ray is certainly about as well known as any piece of classic music she said she never remembered hearing it and yet it seems somehow familiar to her can you make anything out of that marcia couldn't maybe it's all just a notion she said helplessly suppose i play some on the violin here in our window right now she seems to enjoy it so maybe she'll open her shutter again so they sat on the window seat and marcia played her very best including the troy Marais. but no golden head appeared from behind the shutter that afternoon never mind said janet we'll see her tomorrow most likely perhaps she's busy downstairs now but isn't she the prettiest little thing mused marcia reminiscently the loveliest big blue eyes and curly golden hair and such a trusting look on her face somehow it went right down to the very bottom of my heart if it doesn't sound silly to put it that way yes i know agreed janet i felt the same way but doesn't it strike you queer that oh the whole thing's queer interrupted marcia the queerest i've ever heard of i guess you agree with me now janet that i had a secret worth talking about in benedict's folly but let's wait till tomorrow and see what happens the morrow came and went however and nothing happened at all hour after hour the two girls watched for the signal of the white handkerchief but every shuttered window of the old mansion remained blank neither did anyone go in or out of the gate late in the afternoon marcia played again at the window but the sweetest music called forth not a single sign from behind the walls of the house next door janet had but one solution to offer they probably didn't need any marketing done today, so she naturally didn't go out but why couldn't have she at least looked out a moment from her window cried marcia disconsolately surely that would have been easy to do when she said she cared so much for the music she must have known i was playing just for her she may have been somewhere else in the house where she couldn't i can't tell you and oughtn't to blame her without knowing declared janet defending the conduct of the mysterious cicely to-morrow we shall see her again no doubt on the morrow her prophecy was fulfilled they did see her again but under circumstances so peculiar that they were quite dumbfounded all morning they watched and waited in vain for some signal from the upper window but none came and the main part of the afternoon passed away in precisely the same way they sat very conspicuously in their own window seat so that there could be no doubt in cicely's mind about their being home 
marcia even did a little violin practice while they waited and still there was no sign suddenly about five o'clock janet clutched at her chum's arm look she cried marcia looked and down the path from the front door of the strange house she saw cicely dressed to go out approaching the gate it was plain that she was bound for another marketing expedition for the basket hung from her arm well what do you make of that exclaimed marcia in bewilderment did she signal to us no she didn't returned janet i've watched every minute she couldn't have forgotten about it but do you know there may be some very good reason why she didn't or couldn't perhaps she is hoping we will see her and be on hand outside anyway as we promised but she must have seen us sitting at the window argued marcia she might have at least looked up and waved her hand or nodded or smiled or something cicely meanwhile was fumbling with the lock of the big old gate which seemed as on a former occasion to give her a great deal of trouble come cried janet to marcia we'll just about have time to catch her if we hurry and seizing their hats the girls hastened downstairs their front door closed behind them just as cicely came abreast of them what happened next was like a blow in the face they had started forward each with a friendly smile expecting their new companion to meet them in a similar fashion to their amazement cicely marlowe after the first sudden look into their faces dropped her eyes and passed them by without a glance precisely as if they were utter strangers to her both girls gasped stared at her departing figure till she turned round the corner and then into each other's faces the ungrateful little thing marcia presently exploded if that wasn't the cut direct i have never seen it before an unmistakable way of telling us to mind our own business even janet had to admit how humiliating and yet yet what demanded marcia indignantly you're surely not going to try to excuse such inexcusable conduct as that i see very plainly what's happened she thought it over and decided we were meddlesome and just tried to push an acquaintance on her and she thinks that she's a little too exclusive for that kind of thing and the simple remedy was to cut us dead marcia was quite out of breath when she finished this summing up it does look like it janet admitted but somehow even yet i can't feel that she wanted to do it of her own accord i mean but marcia couldn't see it in that light they discussed the question hotly still standing on the front step of the apartment so long in fact did they argue it back and forth turning and twisting the sorry little occurrence viewing it in every possible light that before they realized it cicely was returning her errands accomplished how she had managed to find her way and cross the streets in safety they could only conjecture to reach her own gate she had to pass directly by where they were standing and they saw her approaching down the block here she comes muttered marcia now let's stand right here and watch as she goes by she can't help but see us we'll give her one more chance to do the proper thing and so they waited breathless expectant while the girl came rapidly on her eyes cast down watching the pavement but even when she was quite in front of them she did not once look up and without comment their gaze followed her retreating figure to the gate as she fitted the big key and swung the gate open they were just about to turn to each other in angry impatience when something else happened cicely marlowe turned her head and looked back at them for one long tense moment it was such a wistful imploring look a gaze so full of appeal for forgiveness so plainly in contrast with her recent conduct that their hearts melted at once simultaneously they waved their hands and smiled at her and she smiled back in return the most adorable little smile in the world full of trust and confidence and utter friendliness then she hurried in and closed the gate leaving her two new friends outside 
more bewildered than ever. End of Chapter 4 The Backward Glance Chapter 5 of The Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman The Handkerchief in the Window the next day was spent by the two girls in an expedition to one of the nearby ocean beaches with aunt minerva under ordinary circumstances it was a treat that would have delighted their hearts but as matters stood they only chafed with impatience to be back at their bedroom window watching the house next door the date for the trip however had been set some time before and aunt minerva would have thought it very strange if they had bagged off for such a flimsy reason as they could have offered the day after found them again on the watch though what they expected to see they couldn't have told it was plain that in spite of appearances cicely marlowe's friendly feeling towards them was undiminished the charming backward smile had indicated that unmistakably but how to make it fit in with her refusal to signal and her forbidding conduct they could not understand and the mystery kept them in a constant ferment of surmise but even as they discussed it the next morning their fancy work lying unheeded in their laps they looked out suddenly with a simultaneous gasp of astonishment and delight there was a tiny white handkerchief attached to the shutter in the upper window and fluttering in the breeze it's the signal our signal cried marcia now what shall we do show that we have seen it by waving something here's my red silk scarf no decided janet perhaps she'd rather not have us do anything that might attract attention let's go right down to the street as we said we would and see if she's there they lost not a moment's time in reaching their front steps but there was no sign of cicely till they had come abreast of the benedict gate they discovered this ajar and two blue eyes peering out of the narrow crack as they came in sight there was a smothered exclamation oh i'm so glad the gate opened wider and cicely stood before them you are so good she began at once in a low voice stretching out both hands to them i was afraid you you wouldn't come i left the signal there almost all day yesterday we were away cried marcia promptly i am so sorry we went oh then oh it's all right breathed cicely in relief i was sure you were angry at at the way i acted it was on the tip of marcia's tongue to demand why she had acted so but she refrained and cicely hurried on i i just had to signal for you i we are in great trouble and i don't know what to do oh what is it cried both girls together miss miss benedict is very ill she continued hesitatingly she fell and hurt her ankle the other day and it's been getting worse ever since she's in bed suffering great pain both yesterday and today it's terribly swelled but why don't you send for the doctor interrupted janet hastily she ought to have one if it's as bad as that i asked her that too yesterday and she only said no no i cannot i must not have a doctor child and when i asked what i could do for her she answered i don't know i'm sure so there she lies just suffering and and i couldn't think of anything else to do so i signaled you you are my only friends in all this city there was something infinitely pathetic about the way she brought out this last statement it touched the hearts of both her listeners and because of it they inwardly forgave her once and for all for any action of hers that had offended them and they had good sense not to comment on the strangeness of miss benedict's behavior well if she won't have a doctor we must think of what else there is to be done began janet practically i wish you would let me bring in aunt minerva to see her said marcia she hurt her ankle just like that two years ago and she'd know exactly what oh no no cried cicely starting forward miss benedict would not want that does not want to see any one please please do not even mention to your aunt anything about her or me miss benedict would not wish it the request was certainly very peculiar but the girls were able to conceal their surprise great as it was very well said marcia soothingly if you'd rather have it that way we certainly won't speak of it but i just had another idea i remember aunt minerva had a certain kind of salve that she used for her ankle 
and she kept it tightly bandaged on it did her lots of good cured her in fact now i believe i could get that salve at the drug store here oh could you exclaimed cecily in immense relief let's go at once but you needn't trouble to go said marcia we won't be ten minutes and we'll come right back with it i'd prefer to go replied cecily marlowe with such an air of quiet finality that neither dared to question it all three started out after cecily had locked the gate and proceeded to the nearest drug store here marcia made the purchase and paid for it from the change in her own handbag but when they were outside the store cecily turned to her gravely i have a little english money of my own but i did not like to offer in the shop if you will will tell me how much the salve cost in shillings i will give it to you and she held out several english shillings to marcia oh you needn't do that i'm glad to be able to think of something to do for miss benedict it's such a little matter please reiterated cecily i wish to tell her i bought it myself why cried marcia and then the next moment wish she could recall the question that seemed to border on the personal because i i dare not tell her i have have been talking to you hesitated cecily in an unusual burst of candor and after that revelation they all walked back to the gate in an uneasy silence when they stood again in the front of the blank barrier of the mysterious house cecily turned to marcia i love your music she said i always listen to it whenever you play i knew you had been playing just for me these last few days and i wanted to look out of my window and and wave to you but i must not i am always there when you play listening i wanted you to know it oh i'm so glad cried marcia delightedly i hoped it would please you i'll play more than ever now i'll do all my practicing there too cecily said janet abruptly venturing on personal ground for the first time you are very lonely there in that big house with no other young folks aren't you yes answered cecily speaking very low and glancing in an uncertain way at the gate well why don't you ask er miss benedict if you couldn't run in and visit us once in a while or go out for a walk with us sometimes surely she wouldn't object to that oh no no cried cecily hastily i'd oh how i would love to but but it wouldn't do it wouldn't be allowed no i must not there was nothing more to be said well at least then added marcia you'll let us know if you need anything else you'll signal to us yes said cecily i'll do that she got out the key and unlocked the gate then she faced them with a sudden passionate sob you are so wonderfully good to me i love you both you're all i have to care for then the gate was shut, and they heard her footsteps fleeing up the pathway. End of chapter 5 The Handkerchief in the Window Chapter 6 of The Girl Next Door Cicely Reveals Herself That night the two girls held a council of war. It's perfectly plain to me, said Marcia, that that poor little thing is right under Miss Benedict's thumb. I think the way she's treated is scandalous not allowed to go out or speak to or associate with anyone and scared out of her wits all the time evidently what on earth is she there for anyhow janet scorned to reply to the old unanswerable question instead she remarked she's breaking her heart about it too i can see that and marcia wasn't it strange what she said just at the last that she loved us and that we were all that she had to care for where can all of her relatives and family be miss benedict certainly can't be a relative for cicely calls her miss to think of that lovely little thing without a soul to care for her except ourselves why marcia it's it's amazing but the main question now is what are we going to do about it we must help her somehow i know what i'm going to do about it replied marcia decisively i'm going to tell aunt minerva about it and see if she can't wait a minute janet reminded her you forget that cicely fairly begged us not to mention anything about her to anyone that's so said marcia looking blank what are we going to do then there's only one thing i can think of answered janet slowly 
miss benedict may forbid cecily to meet or speak to us but she can't forbid us meeting and speaking to cecily can she so why can't we just watch for cecily to come out then go and join her she can't stop us she can't help herself and between you and me i think she'll only be too delighted good enough laughed marcia but what an ogre that miss benedict must be i am horribly disappointed about her after i heard her speak that time i was sure she must be lovely it doesn't seem possible that any one with such a wonderful sympathetic voice could be so so downright hateful to a dear little thing like cecily i must say it seems just horrid cried janet vehemently that night after darkness had fallen the two girls settling themselves without a light at their open window heard as marcia had once before described the sound of running feet in the garden beyond the wall this time there was no doubt in their minds about it it was certainly cecily taking a little exercise probably on the deserted path i wonder why she runs marveled marcia i shouldn't feel like running around there all by myself i think i can understand though added janet she's cooped up all day in that dreary old place and probably has to keep awfully quiet i'd go crazy if i were shut in like that i feel like like jumping hurdles when i got out of doors and she's a country girl too remember get your violin marcia and play something i know it will comfort her to know we're nearby and thinking of her so marcia brought out her violin and out into the darkness of the night floated the dreamy tender melody of the troy marie the romance of the situation appealed to her and she played it as she had never had before at the first notes the running footsteps ceased and there was silence in the garden when the music ended they thought they could distinguish a soft little sound half sigh half sob from the velvet blackness below but they could not be sure and a little later came the click of a closing door marcia put down her violin the lonely lonely little thing she exclaimed half under her breath for two days thereafter they maintained a constant but fruitless vigil over benedict's folly cicely did not appear either at her window or on a marketing expedition neither was there any sound of her footsteps in the garden at night the girls began to worry could it be that miss benedict had discovered the truth about the remedy for her sprained ankle and had perhaps shut cicely up in close confinement or even sent her away altogether they were at this time at a loss as to just what to think of that mysterious lady on the third afternoon however to their intense relief they saw cicely emerge from the house and walk towards the gate with a market basket on her arm it took them just about a minute and a half to reach the street cicely came abreast of their own doorstep in due time her eyes cast down as usual but they were waiting in the vestibule and she did not see them she was well in advance but still in sight when they came down the steps and strolled in the same direction it was not till they had turned the corner that they raced after her and at last breathless caught up with her oh she exclaimed with a little start why i did not expect to see you to-day i you just mustn't come with me in spite of her words however it was evident that she was really delighted by their unexpected appearance look here cecily began marcia why can't we join you when you go to market or are doing your errands oh that would be lovely answered cecily only miss benedict usually asks me when i come in whether i have met or spoken to any one and i can't tell what isn't true here was a poser the girls looked crestfallen no you can't of course hesitated janet and besides that went on cecily this is the last time i shall go anyhow because she is very much better now the salve helped her ankle very much and she says she is going out herself after this i don't expect to get out again there was a moment of horrified silence after this blow then janet no longer able to endure the bewilderment burst out cecily dear please forgive us if we seem to be prying into your affairs it's only because we think so much of you but who is miss benedict and what is she to you i don't know 
said Cicely slowly. "'You don't know!' they gasped in chorus. "'No, I really don't. "'It must seem very strange to you, and it does to me. "'Miss Benedict is a perfect stranger to me, "'and no relation, so far as I know. "'I never saw or heard of her before I came here.' "'But why are you here, then?' demanded Marcia. "'I don't know. It's all a mystery to me. "'But I'm so lonely, I've cried myself to sleep many a night.' "'Won't you tell us about it?' begged Marcia. "'We're your friend, Cicely. "'You say the only ones you have, "'and we don't ask just out of curiosity, "'but because we're interested in you, and, and we love you.' "'Well, I will, then.' agreed the girl as they walked along. I'll just tell you how it all happened. Ever since I could remember anything, I've lived in Cranby, a little village in England. Mother and I lived there together. We never went anywhere, not even up to London, because she was never very strong. Father was dead. He died when I was a tiny baby, she told me. We just had a happy, quiet life together, we two. Well, about the beginning of this year, Mother was suddenly taken very, very ill. I don't know what was the matter, but I hardly had time to call in a neighbor and then bring the doctor. Cicely paused and choked down a rising sob. She, she just slipped away before we knew it. She went on very low. Marcia pressed her hand in wordless sympathy. Presently, Cicely continued. Afterward, the neighbor, Miss Waddington, told me that while I was fetching the doctor, Mother had begged her to see that, if she didn't recover, I should be taken over to New York and left with a family named Benedict, and she had Miss Waddington write down the address. But just then Mother grew so much worse that she couldn't explain why I was to be taken there, or what they were to me, or I to them. After it was all over, we searched everywhere, hoping to find some papers or letters or something that would tell but we found nothing. So Mrs. Waddington kept me with her for two or three months. Then a friend of hers, a Mrs. Bidwell, was going to the States, and it was arranged that I should go in her care. About two weeks before we sailed, Mrs. Bidwell wrote to the Benedict family, saying that she was bringing me to New York. So we sailed from Liverpool, and the very day we landed, Mrs. Bidwell brought me here. We rang the old bell at the gate, and then waited and waited. We thought no one would ever come, but at last the gate opened, and Miss Benedict stood there in her hat and veil. She acted very strangely from the first. Mrs. Bidwell told her all about me, and she never said a single word, but only shook her head several times. I thought she was certainly going to refuse to take me in. Her manner was so odd. After she had stood thinking for a long time, she suddenly said to me, "'Come, then,' and to Mrs. Bidwell, I thank you. And she led me inside, followed by the driver with my box, and shut the gate. Cicely stopped short, as if that were the end of the story. Oh, but go on, stammered Marcia, quivering with impatience. But I must do my marketing now, said Cicely. Here we are at the shop. I will tell you the rest when we come out. End of chapter 6 Cicely Reveals Herself Chapter 7 of The Girl Next Door Surprises All Around How long have you been in New York? began Janet, when they at last emerged from the little shop. About two months, said Cicely, and I have lived in that place all this time, and have not known why. Miss Benedict has never explained. She acts towards me as if I were a lodger, or, or someone she has allowed to stay there for reasons of her own, but didn't particularly want to have about. She's kind to me, but never friendly. Sometimes she looks at me in the strangest way. I can't imagine what she's thinking about. But why does she live like this? And she turned inquiring eyes on the girls. I'm sure we don't know, exclaimed Marcia. We only wonder about it. The house seems to be all shut up. Why, it is, Cicely enlightened them. And it makes it so dark and gloomy. There is lovely furniture in the drawing-room, but it is all covered over with some brown stuff, even the pictures. And most of the other rooms are not used at all. Nothing on the ground floor. I eat down in the basement, 
and my bedroom is on the top floor where i looked out that time i have never been in any other bedrooms except miss benedict's when her ankle was bad but what do you do with yourself all day asked janet i keep my room in order and i help miss benedict whenever she lets me of course she prepares all the food herself but in such a pretty dainty way but there are good many hours when the time hangs so heavy on my hands sometimes she lets me dust the rooms on the ground floor she keeps everything very very neat even if it is all covered up and never used the rest of the time i sit in my room and i read the few books i brought with me and i tell myself long stories or listen to your music i dare not now even to peep through the shutters once i opened them when you were playing but miss benedict came in and forbade me to do it again doesn't she ever let you go out and take a walk or get a little exercise questioned marcia no the only times i've gone out have been just lately when her ankle has been so bad at night after it's dark she lets me run about the garden a bit but never in the daytime but how did she find out about your knowing us broke in janet why of course i told her that first time when you were so good to me all about meeting you and how lovely you were to me i thought she'd be so glad i'd have found such nice friends but she looked so queer almost frightened and she said you must not speak to them again it was kind of them to help you but you must not encourage them in any way remember child and i was only trying to obey her when i passed you without looking up the second time i went out cicely said marcia suddenly what does miss benedict look like anyhow do you ever see her without that veil isn't she very old and plain why no answered cicely simply she's very beautiful what they gasped in chorus yes i was surprised too that day that i came after the driver brought in my box into the hall she wouldn't let him take it any further and she shut the door behind him and we were left all alone she seemed to to hesitate but at last she raised her hands and took her off her bonnet and veil i don't know what i expected but i was surprised to see such a lovely face her hair is gray almost white and so soft and wavy and yet she has rosy cheeks and white teeth and the most big beautiful gray eyes and her voice is very sweet too do you know i believe if she'd only let me i could just love her but she holds me off as if she were somehow afraid of me it's all very strange the girls were completely nonplussed by this latest bit of information and found it hard to couple cicely's attractive picture with the little black robed and veiled figure that they knew as miss benedict the voice alone tallied and marcia recounted how she had once met miss benedict in the little grocery shop suddenly however she was struck by a new thought and demanded but how about the other one cicely opened her eyes wide other one she queried oh you mean the other person in the house why yes said marcia the other old lady who sits in the room on the second floor oh is it an old lady inquired cicely in surprise why of course didn't you know it exclaimed marcia i knew there was someone in there some invalid for miss benedict has always warned me to be very quiet in going by that door because some one was ill in there but she never told me who it was nor anything more about her she always waits on herself even when her ankle was hurting her so she would drag herself out of bed many times a day and go into that room but tell me how did you know that there was an old lady in there then marcia recounted what she had seen on the night the wind tore open the shutter how strange this all is she ended that miss benedict should never tell you who the person is why do you suppose she is keeping it a secret as this was a problem none of them could solve they could only conjecture vainly about it as they walked along but by this time they had approached within a block of the house itself and before they turned the corner once more they all unconsciously halted cicely said marcia suddenly inspired with a bright idea i have the grandest scheme if miss benedict is going to do the marketing after this perhaps we won't see you again for some time 
but i have a plan by which we can hear from each other as often as we like you take a walk in the garden every night don't you no not always answered cecily miss benedict allows me to but i often don't care to it's so dark and and lonesome well after this be sure to go out every night our window you know is directly over the garden wall only three stories up i'm going to have a long string with a weight attached to it and fasten it to the window every night after dark we'll write a note to you fasten it on the string and drop it down into the garden among the bushes you can find it in the dark by feeling for the string and if you have one written to us you can fasten it on and we'll pull it up isn't that a dandy idea cicely's eyes sparkled for a moment but suddenly her face clouded oh it it would be glorious she murmured only i must not even if miss benedict doesn't know about it i know she would forbid it if she did so it would be wrong for me to do oh cicely why should you care cried marcia impatiently and why should she object to three girls sending little notes to one another it would be cruel to forbid that it isn't really wrong you know but she isn't cruel to me cicely interrupted you mustn't think that she well somehow i feel she would be nice to me only something is holding her back she isn't a bit cruel i sometimes feel as if i could care for her in spite of everything so i don't want to go against her wishes well then began janet here's a way out of it we'll write to you anyhow miss benedict can't forbid us to do that and you needn't answer at all needn't even read them if you don't want to but we'll write nevertheless and you can't prevent it when cicely smiled her face lit up as if it was touched by a shaft of sunlight and she smiled now i don't believe i ought to read them she said but oh it would keep me from being so very lonely but i must be going back now i've been longer than usual good-bye cicely was still smiling as she turned away while janet and marcia stood looking after her waving farewell to her as she rounded the corner end of chapter seven surprises all around chapter eight of the girl next door at the end of the string it was past midnight that night before the two girls could settle themselves for a wink of sleep so bewildering had been cicely's revelations about herself and miss benedict and the conditions in the mysterious house that they found inexhaustible food for discussion and conjecture the most interesting question of course was the absorbing mystery of how cicely came to be there at all why should have her mother set her there demanded marcia for the twentieth time perhaps she was a relative ventured janet that's perfect nonsense argued marcia for then miss benedict would have surely acted quite differently if she had been the most distant connection miss benedict would have surely told her no i should say that she might be the child of a friend that miss benedict never cared particularly about and yet she doesn't quite like to send her away isn't it a puzzle but what do you think of miss benedict being beautiful i can't imagine it and then too think of cicely's not knowing that there was another old lady in the house added janet what a darling cicely is exclaimed marcia irrelevantly if miss benedict knew how sweet and loyal and obedient cicely is she would be a little less strict with her i'm sure i suppose she doesn't want her to gossip about what goes on in the queer house and by the way we must get our string in working order tonight let's send her other things besides notes too things she'd enjoy and until they fell asleep they planned the campaign for lighting the lonely hours of the girl next door the next day they jointly wrote a long letter telling all about themselves their homes their schools their studies and any other items they thought might interest her fastened it to the end of the string and dropped it into the dark garden after nightfall later they heard cicely's light footsteps in the gloom below and when they pulled up the string just before they went to bed the note was gone well she's evidently decided that it would be all right for her to take it said janet and i'm relieved even if she doesn't answer i can see why she mightn't think it right to do that and now we must plan to send her something besides every once in a while 
i should think that she would just die of lonesomeness in that old place and with hardly a thing to do either that night they sent her down a little box of fudge that they had made in the afternoon and the next night a book that had captivated them both and when they pulled up the string the evening after there was the book again and in it a tiny note which ran dear girls you are too too good to me i ought not to be writing this it is wrong i fear but i just cannot sleep until i have thanked you for the sweets and this beautiful book i read it all to-day you are making me very happy i love you both cicely meantime they had seen miss benedict go in and out once or twice limping slightly and had watched her veiled figure with absorbed interest who could possibly imagine her as beautiful they marvelled and truly it was an effort of imagination to connect beauty with the queer oddly arrayed little figure also at various times during each day marcia made a point of giving a little violin concert at her window and at janet's suggestion had chosen the liveliest and most cheerful music in her repertoire for sad little cicely's entertainment the two girls likewise exhausted every possibility in the line of small gifts and tiny trifles to amuse and entertain their young neighbor but there was no farther communication from her until one night after they had set down an embroidery ring and silks the latest pattern of a dainty boudoir cap and elaborate instructions how to embroider it the next night there was a note at the end of the string when they drew it up it read how dear of you to send me this i love to embroider and had brought no materials with me and now i want to ask you a question do you mind what i do with it after it is finished is it my very own what can i ever do to repay you for all your kindness in their answer they assured her that she could make any use of the boudoir cap that pleased her and then they spent much time wondering what use she was going to make of it two nights later when they pulled up the string they found to their surprise a small parcel attached to the end it contained a little box in which lay wrapped in jeweler's cotton a tiny coral pendant and an old-fashioned gold setting and a silver bracelet of thin filigree work the pendant was labeled for marcia with cicely's love and the bracelet for janet with love from cicely the two girls gazed at the pathetic little gifts and sudden tears came into their eyes oh jan half sobbed marcia we oughtn't keep them they are probably the only trinkets she has but jan was wiser we must keep them she decided cicely doesn't want all the giving to be on one side and she has probably been longing to do something for us i suppose these are the only things that she had that would be suitable much as i hate to have her deprive herself of them i know she would be terribly hurt if we sent them back to-morrow we must write her the best letter of thanks we can so the days went by for two or three weeks the girls caught in all this time not so much as one glimpse of cicely but they managed thanks to their line of communication to keep constantly in touch with her meanwhile the summer weather waxed hotter and hotter and the city fairly steamed under the july sun their own time was taken up by many diversions trips to the parks beaches and zoo excursions out of town with aunt minerva shopping and quiet sewing or reading in their pleasant living room every time they went out of their home on a pleasure jaunt they felt guilty to think of the lonely little prisoner cooped up in the dreary house next door and they both declared that they would gladly give up their places to her had such a thing been possible then one night something unusual occurred they sent down the usual note and also a little work basket of indian woven sweet grass the souvenir of a recent trip to the seaside to their astonishment when they drew up the string both the note and the basket were still attached it was the first time such a thing had happened what can be the matter queried marcia can it be possible that cicely feels that she mustn't do this any more i didn't hear any footsteps down there to-night did you said janet no come to think of it i didn't she must have stayed indoors for the first time since we began this but what do you suppose is the reason 
Janet suddenly clutched her friend. Marcia, can it be possible that Miss Benedict has discovered what we've been doing and won't let her come out any more? I believe that's it. Marcia's voice was sharp with consternation. Wouldn't it be dreadful if it's so? They sat gloomily thinking it over. Well, what are we going to do about it? demanded Marcia. Wait till tomorrow night and try again, counseled Janet. It's just possible Cicely had a headache or felt sick from this abominable heat and couldn't come down. Let's see what happens tomorrow. The next night they tied the basket and another note to the string and dropped it down hopefully, but they drew it up untouched, precisely the same as before. It's just one of two things, decided Marcia. Either Cicely is ill, or Miss Benedict has found out about our little plan and forbidden Cicely to go on with it. What are we to do? Keep on sending notes or stop it? Suppose Miss Benedict herself should find one sometime. I don't care, cried Janet decisively. If Cicely is ill, she'll get better pretty soon and come out some night, and there'll be nothing for her. She'll be dreadfully disappointed. I don't care if there is the possibility that Miss Benedict knows all about it. I'm going to keep right on writing and take the chance. For a whole week they followed their usual program, nightly sending down a fresh note that they always later drew up, unclaimed. And as the days passed, they became more and more alarmed. Something had certainly happened to Cicely. Of that they were sure, and their misgivings grew more keen with the passing time. Can it be that she isn't there any more? conjectured Marcia suddenly one day. Perhaps Miss Benedict has sent her away. This was a new and startling possibility. The more they contemplated it, the more depressed they grew. If that was the case, then they might never see Cicely again, and the delightful and curious friendship would be ended forever. Their usual good spirits were quite subdued, and even their hearty appetites suffered somewhat, which worried Aunt Minerva not a little though she attributed it to the heat. Finally, one night, precisely one week after the first unclaimed communication, they sent down the usual letter, begging Cicely, if possible, to let them know what was the matter. It seemed to both, during the interval that they left it there, that they heard light, almost stealthy footsteps in the garden below, but neither felt certain about it. An hour later they drew up the string. Their own note was still attached to it at the bottom but just above they saw fastened a little scrap of paper, no bigger than a quarter of an ordinary note sheet. Both girls started with delight. Quick, cried Marcia, Cicely has answered at last. Oh, I'm so glad. Janet unfastened it, her fingers trembling with excitement, and spread it out on the table. It was not Cicely's handwriting, and contained but a few words. Both girls read it at a glance, and then stared into each other's eyes, half terror-stricken, half amazed, for this is what it said. Will you please come to the gate tomorrow morning at half-past nine? A. Benedict End of chapter 8 At the End of the String Chapter 9 of The Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman For the Sake of Sicily What can it mean? muttered Janet. What does she want of us? Why, it's perfectly plain, declared Marcia. She has discovered that we have been trying to correspond with Cicely, and she's going to demand an explanation. Probably warn us that we must stop it. Are you afraid to go, Janet? Not I. Why should I be? Miss Benedict can't do or say a thing to harm us, but I am anxious for poor little Cicely. I just hate to think that we may have brought trouble on her. Oh, I wish now we'd never suggested such a thing, moaned Marcia. We've just succeeded in making that poor little thing miserable, I suppose. Well, we can only remember that we meant to make her happy, and we did, for a while at least, comforted Janet. And what's more, I'm not going to worry about it another bit tonight. Maybe it's something entirely different anyway. Marcia, however, could not bring herself to this cheerful view of things. All night long she tossed beside the sleeping Janet, wondering and wondering about what the coming interview might mean, and blaming herself a thousand times for placing Cicely in a position of having deceived her guardian. When morning came, she was pale and heavy-eyed, which alarmed her aunt not a little. "'You ought not to go out this morning, Marcia,' remarked Miss Minerva anxiously. "'The sun is very hot, and you look as if you had a headache.' 
oh no i haven't auntie cried marcia eagerly fearful of a hitch in their plans i didn't sleep very well but a walk in the fresh air will do me good i know and so miss minerva saw them go without further protest both girls halted at the gate in the brick wall and looked into each other's eyes the hot morning sun beat down upon them as they stood there and passers-by eyed them curiously each was perfectly certain that the thumping of her heart could be heard and still they stood hesitating you're afraid accused janet i'm not protested marcia and i'll prove it she raised her hand suddenly and pulled the rusty bell handle it seemed a long long time before there was any response but at last they heard the click of the opening front door and the sound of footsteps on the path this was followed by the creaking of a key turning in the lock of the gate janet gripped marcia by the hand and with pounding hearts they stood together while the gate slowly opened in another instant the veiled black-gowned figure of miss benedict stood before them she waited a moment silent appearing to look them over critically come in if you please she said at last very softly and held the gate open for them they entered obediently and she shut the gate it was not until they were inside the house standing in the dim hall with the front door closed behind them that another word was spoken then miss benedict faced them again but she did not remove her bonnet or throw back her veil i have asked you to come here this morning she began because i understand that you have become acquainted with the child cicely marlowe cold chills ran up and down their spines it had come at last yes faltered janet we we have become acquainted with her it was not a brilliant reply but for the life of her she could think of nothing else to say they waited shuddering for what might be coming next so she has told me went on miss benedict i also understand that lately you have been dropping notes to her and to the garden at night janet noticed even in the midst of her trepidation how wonderfully sweet and soft and harmonious the voice was yes replied marcia very low we have the worst was out now let the blow fall they braced themselves to receive it cicely is ill said miss benedict abruptly they each uttered a startled little oh she has not been at all well for over a week the lovely voice continued i am very much worried about her janet and marcia glanced into each other's eyes in astonishment cicely ill and miss benedict actually caring about it here were surprises indeed oh i hope it's nothing serious exclaimed marcia anxiously i hope it is not and i think it is probably only the hot weather and and want of exercise miss benedict hesitated a little over the last she has been so poorly and has has evidently been so anxious to to see you that i thought i would surprise her by asking you to come and visit her a while it was plainly a struggle for miss benedict to make this seem the natural normal thing to do will you come up to her room the girls were almost too stunned at the turn of events had taken to reply why we'd be glad to faltered marcia at last then if you will follow me miss benedict led the way through the dark halls and up three pairs of stairs at the door of the room on the fourth floor she paused knocking then entered they followed dimly perceiving a little form in the bed for the shutters of course were closed as they entered after miss benedict cicely sprang to a sitting posture with a cry of mingled wonder consternation and joy she too glanced uncertainly at miss benedict i have asked your friends to come and and see you for a while she explained hesitatingly to the bewildered child perhaps it will make you feel better then she turned abruptly and went out of the room closing the door after her for a moment they stared at one another cicely cried janet at length what does this all mean anyway i never dreamed of such a thing as seeing you here faltered the invalid what made her do it demanded marcia we found a note 
from her tied to our string how did she know about it cicely seemed to shrink back at this piece of news i told her myself she said i was very sick one night and i think i had a fever my head was so hot and ached so and she was oh so good to me i could hardly believe it she bathed my head and sat by me and put her cool hands on my forehead it really seemed as if she cared and i felt so ashamed to think i'd disobeyed her that i told her right out all about it how lonely i had been and how good you were to me and how i enjoyed hearing from you and what did she say breathed marcia in an awestruck whisper not a word except never mind now little girl and she never said a thing more about it i didn't dream that she would ever do such a thing as send for you to come and see me they marvelled over it all a moment in silence then marcia burst out oh cicely we have been so worried about you we couldn't think of why you didn't even take the letters any more have you been very ill why i don't know i just feel horrid most of the time my head aches a lot and every once in a while i'm awfully cold and then i seem to be burning up why i believe you must have malaria interrupted marcia that's what aunt minerva has sometimes you ought to go out more and have fresh air and sunshine she stopped suddenly remembering the conditions but anyway it isn't serious she hurried on after an embarrassed pause and you ought to have some quinine i wonder if miss benedict would let us get it for you i'll ask her later then they hurried on to tell her how they had continued to send down a note every night hoping that she would get it and how they feared that she might have gone away and cicely in return told them how she had enjoyed the notes and gifts but how guilty she had always felt about receiving them especially when she had answered them and i finished embroidering the boudoir cap she ended and and i gave it to miss benedict you did they both gasped oh i hope you don't mind exclaimed cicely hastily but but i felt if i wanted to do something for her she i i think that i'm getting to like her more and more what did she say asked marcia was she pleased i can't imagine her wearing such a thing she looked at it and then at me very strangely for a minute then she said thank you child i i never wear such things but i will keep it for your sake isn't that queer exclaimed janet i thought she cared nothing about you yes agreed cicely but lately i'm not so sure in the pause that followed the girls glanced curiously about the darkened room trying to realize that they were actually inside the mysterious house at last it was a large square room furnished with heavy chairs and an old-fashioned bureau and bed every shutter was fastened and the slats tightly closed only the dimmest daylight filtered in the effect was gloomy and depressing to the last degree they wondered how cicely had stood it so long i'm going to ask miss benedict if we can't open these shutters cried janet suddenly i should think you'd die of this gloom it's really bad for you cicely oh don't exclaimed cicely in consternation i asked her once when i first came and she didn't like it at all she said no she preferred to have them shut and i must not touch them i don't care went on janet ruthlessly you weren't sick then i'm sure she'd let you now and true to her word she turned to miss benedict who entered at this moment still bonneted and veiled i believe cicely has malaria miss benedict she began bravely but with inward trepidation oh do you think so is it serious the melodious voice sounded startled and concerned i don't think it's so serious janet continued but she would probably get over it quicker if she had lots of fresh air and sunshine couldn't she have the shutters open it would do her lots of good cicely and marcia trembled at janet's temerity and watched miss benedict with bated breath but instead of being annoyed she only seemed surprised and relieved why do you think so she queried then surely they may be opened i i do not like the the glare of so much daylight myself but cicely may have it here if she chooses and following up her words she pushed open one of the shutters a broad shaft of sunlight streamed in and blinking from the previous gloom 
Janet and Marcia threw open the others. Cicely gave a delighted cry. Oh, how lovely it is to see the sun again! But Miss Benedict, with an abrupt exclamation, retreated hastily from the room. The girls stayed a few minutes more chatting, and then wisely suggested that perhaps they had better go and not tire Cicely by too long a call. Hearing Miss Benedict's footsteps in the hall below, they took their leave, promising to come again as soon as it seemed best. On the landing of the stairway they found the black-veiled figure apparently waiting for them. Now, during all of the strange little interview, a curious impression had been growing upon Janet, strengthened by every word Miss Benedict had uttered, an impression that there was no grim, forbidding jailer, such as they had imagined the mistress of Benedict's folly to be. Instead they had encountered a gentle, almost winning little person, worried about the illness of the child in her care and plainly anxious to do everything suggested to make her more comfortable janet suddenly resolved on a bold move cicely is so lonely she began turning to miss benedict don't you think it would do her lots of good to come in and visit us once in a while marcia's aunt would be so glad to see her as soon as she is a little better can't she no interrupted miss benedict her little figure suddenly stiffening and a determined note creeping into her soft voice i am sorry cicely cannot make visits it is out of the question it was like striking a hidden rock in a smooth beautiful sheet of water and her words emitted no argument janet and marcia followed her meekly and in silence down to the front door here in an uncertain pause marcia made one further suggestion may we bring cicely some quinine she ventured if she has malaria she ought to have that we have lots of it at home that would be very kind of you replied miss benedict in an entirely different tone come to-morrow and see her again if your aunt will permit it perhaps it would be well to explain to her and here her manner became confused that i er don't make calls or receive them but this is just just for the sake of the child it was plain to the girls that this omission was wrung from her only by great effort she opened the front door and followed them to the gate when she had unlocked it marcia turned to her impulsively thank you so much for letting us come we are very very fond of cicely she is such a dear and we have been terribly worried about her as a relative i am afraid you have been still more anxious the black figure started she is no relative of mine came abruptly behind the veil oh i beg your pardon i should say friend stuttered marcia embarrassed or or the daughter of a friend perhaps she is not miss benedict counterdicted in a strange flat tone as if repeating a lesson i do not know who she is nor why she is here end of chapter nine for the sake of sicily Chapter Ten of the Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman. The Filigree Bracelet. Aunt Minerva took off her silver rimmed spectacles, wiped them excitedly, and put them on again. And you say she didn't know who the child was or why she was there? Well, I never! She exclaimed, adjusting them all awry. Marcia had decided to tell her aunt all about it, and Janet had agreed with her that since Miss Benedict had spoken as she did, there could be no further occasion for secrecy. So that night they gave her the entire history of the affair and found her a willing listener, interested and sympathetic beyond their wildest expectations. "'Why, Auntie, I didn't suppose you cared much about it!' exclaimed Marcia in surprise. "'And here you are, nearly as excited over it as we have been!' why who wouldn't be said miss minerva it's precisely like a mystery in a book i wasn't interested in that old place at first because i was too busy and it seemed as if the people living there were such slack housekeepers i haven't any sympathy with that but what could she mean by that last remark not know who the child is or why she's there it's absurd i can't believe it well that's what she said asserted marcia again and if anyone ever heard a bigger mystery i'd like to know about it miss minerva took up her mending again then i don't see why she keeps the girl she commented she keeps her i think because she's getting sort of fond of her reasoned janet you can easily see that 
cicely said that she was very good to her on the night that she was so ill and then too it must have been a hard pull for her to go so far as to send for us to come in just because it might please cicely we must see that that child has the quinine and it wouldn't hurt her to have a glass or two of currant jelly don't forget them when you go in tomorrow miss minerva reminded them i like to have her here and nurse her myself and feed her up a bit and that's another strange thing why should that woman miss minerva invariably alluded to miss benedict as that woman allow you to go in and visit the child yet forbid her to visit you don't ask us why laughed marcia we're as much in the dark as anyone else what i want to know is why miss benedict allowed cicely to open her shutters today when she refused her a while ago and why doesn't she open them over all the rest of the house well what i want to know added janet is why cicely's mother should have sent her over here to the benedicts at all when nobody knew her or claimed her whatever made her think of such a thing there are several explanations that might suit the case mused miss minerva miss marlowe might have been a married sister or some distant relative who then wouldn't miss benedict know about it or at least suspect some connection interrupted marcia that's true acknowledged her aunt there must be some other explanation what a puzzle what's more added janet i remember that cicely told us this when she first came miss benedict questioned her all about herself where she came from and all that and after cicely had told her she never said a word just walked away shaking her head miss minerva's mind suddenly took a new turn didn't you say the child sent you a couple of gifts little trinkets not long ago i'd like to see them we've never worn them said marcia it just seemed as if we couldn't she ought not to have given them away and yet i know just how she felt she wanted to do something i'll get them she brought the box and laid it in her aunt's lap miss minerva examined the coral pendant first the little dear thing she murmured she must think a lot of you to have parted with this then she laid it down and took up the bracelet gracious she exclaimed immediately letting it fall and then picking it up again am i going crazy or are my eyes deceiving me she turned it over and over what's the matter cried both girls at once matter cried miss minerva why just this that bracelet is exactly like one i had put away for years the girls stared at her incredulously i'll get it this minute and prove it and she hurried out of the room while she was gone they examined the bracelet more closely than they had done yet it consisted of two thin rims of silver joined by silver filigree work a quarter of an inch wide here and there at intervals in the filigree and forming part of the pattern were several strange characters looking as marcia declared like those on the receipt from the chinese laundry the workmanship was unusually delicate and beautiful in five minutes miss minerva was back flushed and disheveled from a hunt through several bureau drawers and boxes i couldn't find it at first she panted and northam i used to be able to lay my hand on anything i wanted at an instant's notice but in this apartment she heaved a resigned sigh and laid something beside the bracelet on the table it was the exact duplicate in every last detail even the complicated characters were identical the three stared at the trinkets in expressive silence not for a moment could it be doubted that these two bracelets were once a pair they were so unusual that it was impossible that there could be others like them this astonishing fact was patent to them all aunt minerva where did you get yours breathed marcia at last well that's easily explained answered miss brett your father brought it to me about ten or twelve years ago after one of his voyages he said that a chinese sailor in hong kong had offered to sell it to him for a small sum and seeing it was a rather unique little trinket he bought it and brought it home to me i never wear such things however jewelry never did appeal to me and bracelets particularly always seemed a nuisance so i put it away intending to give it to you some day marcia and after a while i actually forgot all about it till tonight janet sat up very straight there's just one thing i'd give my head to know this minute where did cicely get her bracelet 
well that you can easily find out but i'm afraid you'll have to wait until tomorrow morning laughed marcia there's something very strange about this marveled miss minerva turning the two trinkets over and over actually i can hardly tell now which one is mine and which hers except that mine is a little more tarnished from having been laid away your father said when he gave me mine that he had never seen anything like it in any of those foreign jewelry shops and that's why he had been specially attracted to it auntie asked marcia suddenly where do you suppose that sailor got it your father said replied miss minerva that he'd probably stolen it or someone else had it may have passed through dozens of hands after it was taken from the original owner you can never tell about such things in the east and it is useless to inquire again they all stared hard at the two silver trinkets laying side by side on the table and these two bracelets once belonged to the same person murmured marcia at last perhaps to some one connected with sicily and to think that they should have drifted halfway around the world to find themselves side by side again in busy practical new york end of chapter ten the filigree bracelet chapter eleven of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman the lifted veil next morning marcia and janet sallied forth to make their promised visit to sicily they were armed with a box of quinine pills two glasses of currant jelly a new magazine marcia's violin in its case and last but not least the two filigree bracelets and they were literally bursting with news and excitement miss benedict opened the gate for them as before and to their inquiries replied that cicely seemed a little better if she noticed the suppressed excitement in their manner she did not comment upon it but only led the way to cicely's room without further words she was bonneted and veiled as usual at the door she left them saying that she would not go in cicely cicely cried marcia immediately we have news such strange news for you cicely was all at once eagerness and animation oh tell me quickly she exclaimed sitting up in the bed i feel so much better and i'm going to get up to-day but how can you have any news about me cicely said janet sitting down on the edge of the bed have you been thinking all this time that miss benedict knew everything about you and why you came here and all of that why of course cried cicely opening her eyes wide she has never explained it to me and she's so queer that i never like to ask her but i always thought she knew well she doesn't not a thing apparently replied janet and then repeated to her all the strange conversation at the gate on the day before when she had finished cicely sat as if stunned quiet and rigid and staring out of the window so much had it appeared to affect her that janet was suddenly sorry she had said a word about it then what does it all mean murmured cicely at last i'm here when i have no right to be nobody knows me or wants me how did it all happen don't i belong to anybody she looked so bewildered so frightened so unhappy that janet and marcia both put their arms about her it's all right cicely it's sure to be all right in the end we would love you and want you if nobody else did and i'm sure miss benedict must care for you too she really acts so but the question is how did you ever come to be sent here at all didn't your mother ever say anything to you about this place or any of the people over here no said cicely in a hushed voice it was evident from her manner that the grief over the loss of her mother was very keen and she had only once voluntarily referred to it or anything connected with it my mother never never mentioned the name of benedict to me i never heard it before but couldn't miss benedict possibly have been some connection some distant connection that she never thought of or mentioned persisted marcia no my mother's people were all english declared cicely and they were all dead we had no relatives living well your father then supplemented janet what about him i never knew him to remember him mother said he died when i was a baby a year or two old he hadn't any relatives either well here's something else we have to tell you and it's the strangest thing yet began janet 
can you tell us where you got that bracelet cicely the one that you were so lovely as to send to us why i've always had it answered cicely even when i was a tiny little girl and it was much too big for me it seemed to be mine mother kept it in a box but she let me play with it once in a while then when i was older and it fitted me better she let me wear it i think she said my father gave it to me but i don't remember very clearly i don't believe i ever thought much about it although i realize it was rather unusual but why do you ask did she ever say that it had a mate that there was a pair of them questioned marcia oh no i am sure she never said anything about another what do you think of this then marcia drew the two bracelets out of her bag and laid them side by side on the bed why how very very queer cried cicely incredulously where did you get the other marcia outlined its history you see there isn't a shadow of a doubt that there was once a pair of them she ended and that they both belonged to the same person now who could that person be it must have been someone connected with you cicely added janet everything points that way well one thing is certain if we could find out the truth about these two bracelets i believe we'd find out about cicely too why she is here in the whole mystery all three were very silent for a moment considering i know one thing ventured marcia at length cicely you must not give this bracelet away it was dear and sweet of you to think of it in the first place and we'll keep the little coral pendant for both of us if you like but the bracelet is something that may mean a great deal to you yet and you ought to have it don't you agree with me janet i certainly do added janet heartily and what's more i've thought of something else when captain brett comes home next time he may be able to tell us something more about the other bracelet when do you expect him marcia not for two or three months replied marcia ruefully i'd give anything if it only could be sooner it seems as if we never could wait that long well let's not think of it just now comforted janet i don't suppose that we can find out anything until he does come so there's no use fretting how would you like to hear some music cicely marcia's brought her violin how good of you cried cicely an almost pathetic eagerness in her voice it will be wonderful to hear it nearby so marcia opened the case took out the instrument tuned it tucked it lovingly under her chin and slipped into a rollicking hungarian dance by brahms while her little audience listened spellbound oh something else please cried cicely blissfully when it was ended and marcia changing the theme gave them the lullaby from jocelyn and after that beethoven's minuet in g just one more begged cicely that is if you're not too tired the one i i like so much i know the troy marie nodded marcia and once more laid her bow across the strings when the last note had died away they were all suddenly startled by a strange sound just outside the door a sound that was partly a sob and partly a half-stifled exclamation before she quite realized what she was doing janet who happened to be sitting near the door sprang up and threw it open in the hall outside stood miss benedict her hands clasped tensely in front of her but strangest of all her veil was thrown back from her face and in the sudden light of the open door she stood revealed in an instant they realized that cicely had not exaggerated the beauty of her singularly lovely face she plainly had been listening captivated to the music within the room and something about it must have stirred her strangely all of this they noticed in a fraction of a moment for as she saw them she pulled down her veil with a hasty movement murmuring something about having heard music and coming to see what it was but she did not pull it down quickly enough to hide one fact from the gaze of the two girls that her beautiful gray eyes were brimming with tears end of chapter eleven the lifted veil chapter twelve of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman miss benedict speaks 
it was miss minerva who decided that miss benedict must be told about the coincidence of the two bracelets certainly she ought to know she declared positively there must be some reason why that child has been sent to her and she ought to be told all the facts concerning her who knows but what she may have some explanation of this bracelet mystery you tell her the very next time you go in and don't forget to take a jar of that quince marmalade besides aunt minerva had determined on keeping cicely well supplied with toothsome dainties which commodities she keenly suspected were scarce in the big house in fact the girls had told her that the marketing for that establishment so far as they had seen seemed to consist mainly of milk and eggs rice and prunes so a day or two after when they visited cecily again they planned to have an interview with her guardian marcia was shy about broaching the subject so the task was left to janet who being anxious to settle the matter immediately began it as soon as the gate was opened miss benedict she said there is something quite strange about cecily that we should like to tell you could you spare a few minutes to hear about it why er of course replied the little black veiled lady in a rather startled voice will you er that is i will come to her room in a little while if you will kindly close the shutters first and she directed them to proceed upstairs without this time accompanying them cicely was overjoyed at their appearance she was sitting by the window fully dressed the sunshine streaming in on her transforming her curls into a radiant halo a definite change had come over her during the last few days caused no doubt by the enjoyment of light and sunshine and companionship she was losing some of her former wan wistful frightened aspect and assuming more of the confiding sunny characteristics that were natural to her at the moment the girls entered she was reading a magazine brought by them on their previous visit after the first greetings and chat they reported their conversation with miss benedict she's coming up soon ended marcia and we must get the shutters closed but what on earth for why can't she be like ordinary people and enjoy the air and sunshine like the rest of us do you know cicely no i can't imagine it has all seemed very strange to me ever since i came but you know how odd miss benedict is i can't abide asking her any questions and she never explains anything the whole house is darkened like this all the time and since she has let me open my shutters she has never once been in this room in the daytime she never goes without that heavy veil not even into the garden i don't understand it do you know suggested marcia half under her breath one would almost think that she had done something wrong and was ashamed of showing her face in the daylight i have heard of such things and that would explain some other queer things about this place too like hush warned janet i hear her coming in another moment miss benedict had opened the door and in the very dim light marcia had been closing the shutters as they talked they saw an unusual sight miss benedict had come to them without her bonnet and veil the change in her appearance was surprising her wonderful white hair was piled on top of her head in a heavy coronet braid her complexion was singularly soft and youthful and her lovely gray eyes even in the dim light easily seemed her most attractive feature it was a curious contrast made by the removal of the ugly bonnet and veil in them she appeared a little insignificant unattractive personality without them though short and slight of figure she possessed a look and a manner almost regal she did not refer to the omission of her usual headgear but took a seat and quietly asked them what they had to tell her janet undertook to explain and began by telling how cicely had sent the little gift to them via the string and ended by explaining about aunt minerva's duplicate miss benedict listened to it all without comment when janet had finished and held out the two bracelets for her to examine she merely took them and laid them in her lap scarcely glancing at them they waited breathless for her response no she said i know nothing about these bracelets it is of course very singular a surprising coincidence that your aunt should have one of them but i know nothing about them any more than i know about cicely herself 
It was the first time she ever referred to the matter before Cicely, and it was evident that it was not easy for her to do. I might as well speak plainly to you all about this, since the matter has come up. I do not know little Cicely. I have never heard of her, nor anything about her before she came here. I cannot imagine why she was sent. I have no relatives whose child she could have been, nor any friend who could have given her into my care. Then why, Janet interrupted, if you will pardon me for asking, Miss Benedict, why did you take her in the day that she came? Miss Benedict's manner instantly became a trifle confused and embarrassed. It is, er, a little difficult to explain, I confess, she stammered. The truth is, I, er, it is commonly reported that we, that is, I, have some means. I have frequently, in the past, received very strange letters from people utterly unknown to me, begging letters, letters proposing to invest my money for me. Oh, I cannot begin to tell you all the strange things those letters propose. I understand that it is not an unusual experience with well-to-do people. I have even received letters proposing that I adopt the writer's children and eventually settle my money on them. Here Janet and Marcia could not repress a giggle, and Miss Benedict smiled slightly in sympathy. It does sound absurd, she admitted, but it's quite true, and has often been most annoying. So when the letter arrived announcing Cicely's coming, for which there was given no particular explanation, I thought it simply another case of a similar kind, and I resolved to dismiss both the child and her attendant as soon as they appeared. But when the day came, strangely enough, I changed my mind. It was Cicely herself led me to do so. I felt as soon as I looked at her, whoever had sent her here, and for whatever purpose, the child herself was innocent of any fraud or imposture. She believed that I would receive her, and I knew it was all right. There was something trusting about her eyes, her look, her whole manner. I cannot explain it. And that was not all. There was another reason. I suddenly realized how very lonely I was, how desirable it would be to have with me a young companion, like Cicely. I know that the life I lead is, is different and peculiar. It is owning to an unusual circumstance that I cannot explain to you, but I have become so accustomed to this life that of late years I scarcely realized it was so different. But when I saw Cicely, I felt suddenly its loneliness. With the laying aside of her veil, Miss Benedict seemed also to have laid aside some of the reticence in which she had shrouded herself, and her three hearers, listening spellbound, realized how utterly charming she could be, if she allowed herself to be so. A great desire seized me, she went on, to take her in and keep her here with me a while. If later someone came to claim her, well and good, I would let her go. Or if no one came, and I found that I had been mistaken, that she was not companionable, I would make some other provision for her. Meanwhile, I would yield to this new desire and enjoy her presence here. In addition to that, the lady in whose company she had traveled was not in a position to keep Cicely longer with her, and the child would be left without protection, so I took her in. And so I have kept her ever since, because I am daily becoming more attached to her. It was a great omission for this reticent little lady, and they all realized it. So deeply were they impressed that none of them could make any response. Presently, Miss Benedict continued. After Cicely had told me her story, I determined to write to the village of Cranby, England, and find out what I could about her mother, Mrs. Marlowe. I knew no one of whom I could address the inquiries, but sent them on chance to the vicar of the parish church. In due time, I received a reply. It stated that Mrs. Marlowe was not a native of that town, but came there to live about twelve years ago with her three-year-old daughter. 
nothing was known about her personal affairs except that her husband and all of her people were dead and that she had come there from a distant part of england because the climate of her former home did not agree with her little daughter she had never talked much about herself and lived in a very retired quiet way she left no property or effects of any value why should she have sent her child to me is as much of a mystery as ever about cicely's father the vicar knew nothing that is all the information i have miss benedict stopped abruptly cicely opened her lips to say something then closed them again without having spoken marcia fidgeted uneasily in her chair miss benedict looked down at her lap an embarrassed silence seemed to have fallen on them all only janet knitting her brows over the puzzle was unaware of it but miss benedict she began we all think that these bracelets may have something to do with cicely's affair might explain a good deal of the mystery if we could only puzzle them out have you noticed what strange signs there are on them we think they must be something in chinese let me give you a little more light and then you can see them better and janet deeply immersed in the subject and still unconscious of her blunder was about to go and open the shutter when miss benedict quickly raised her hand please er please do not she exclaimed hurriedly oh i beg your pardon i forgot cried janet in confusion and the silence at once became more embarrassed than ever so much so in fact that miss benedict evidently felt compelled to explain her conduct and she made the first revelation concerning her singular mode of life i am er my eyes are not able to stand it for years i have suffered with some obscure trouble in them i can see but i cannot stand any bright light it hurts them beyond endurance at home i must have the rooms darkened in this way and when i go out even my heavy veil is not sufficient behind it i must also wear smoked spectacles she said no more but she did not need to a little inarticulate murmur of sympathy rose from her listeners and in the twilight of the room marcia glanced quickly and guiltily into janet's contrite face End of chapter 12 Miss Benedict Speaks Chapter 13 of The Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman Via Wireless It was a week after the events of the last chapter. The girls had gone regularly every day to visit Cicely. It was Marcia who had finally mustered up the courage to ask Miss Benedict if Cicely could not go into the garden and enjoy some outdoor air and sunshine miss benedict had hesitated at first but at last she conceded that cicely and the girls might sit in the garden if they would go out of the house by the small side door and remain on that side of the house they found that this door was on the opposite side of the house from cicely's room consequently they had never seen it and they soon discovered one reason at least why miss benedict wished them to remain exclusively on that side it was screened both back and front by thick bushes and trees and at the side above the garden wall rose the high blank side of a building unrevealed by a single window here they were as absolutely screened from public view as if they were within the house here also was an old rustic bench and table and they spent several happy mornings in the secluded spot sewing reading and chatting cicely seemed fairly to open out before their eyes like a flower bud expanding in warm sunny atmosphere only at times now did she show any trace of the frightened repression of their earlier acquaintance they seldom talked about the mystery surrounding her because they had discovered that any allusion to it only made her uneasy unhappy and rather silent moreover further discussion of it was rather useless as they seemed to have reached a point in its solution beyond which progress was hopeless so they talked gaily about themselves and their own affairs sometimes of their former home in northam the pleasant new england village occasionally cicely would reciprocate by allowing them glimpses of her life in the obscure english village town which she had come only rarely did she allude to the circumstances of her present home and though the girls secretly ached to know more about it they were too tactful to ask any questions one query whose answer they could not guess was this 
who was the other mysterious old lady kept so closely a prisoner in her room by miss benedict and why was she so kept marcia and janet were never tired of discussing this question between themselves that it was a relative they could not doubt and they recalled one or two remarks miss benedict had dropped particularly when she had said we that is i have some means the we must certainly refer to herself and the other one but could that other one be mother sister aunt or cousin and why was there so much secrecy about her cicely had only said that miss benedict referred to her as the lady in there who is not very well but why conceal so carefully just an ordinary invalid you can never tell though remarked janet decisively one night when they had been discussing the matter with aunt minerva were you ever more stunned marcia than at the reason that she gave for having all of the shutters closed i think it was the most pitiful thing i have ever heard i could have just sat and cried about it and it was so different from all the awful things we'd imagined perhaps there is just a good reason for this other mystery but what puzzles me broke in aunt minerva impatiently is why that woman if she is so wealthy doesn't go to a good oculist and have some treatment for her eyes they can do such wonders nowadays why on earth does she endure it i have never heard of anything so silly i suppose it's for the same reason that she wouldn't have a doctor when she hurt her ankle said marcia she evidently doesn't want a stranger in the house even for such important things as those one day cicely asked marcia why she never brought her violin since the occasion of the first visit and requested that she bring it with her the next day and give them a concert so on the following day marcia came armed with her violin case and also an interesting new book from the library that she thought cicely would enjoy let's read the book first cicely elected so sitting in the secluded corner of the garden the three spent a happy morning reading aloud turn about while the others worked at their embroidery at last when all were tired cicely begged marcia to play and she laid her book aside and took up the violin what shall i play she asked something lively no said cicely play something soft and sweet and dreamy i feel just in that mood to-day it's too hot for lively things marcia played the leeds lieberstrom and a lovely setting of the old scotch song loch lomond and after that melody and f and then at cicely's entreating glance she drifted as usual into the trois marie do you know said cicely when she had ended i believe i must have heard the thing when i was a baby it is the only reason i can think of that it seems so so familiar and yet unless i'd hear it a great many many times then i don't think it would have made such an impression on me and where could have i heard it play it again marcia please marcia obligingly began but she had gone no farther than the first few measures when the door opened and miss benedict appeared she seemed very much agitated and her bonnet and veil donned in an evident hurry were slightly array i beg you she began turning to marcia not to play any more i er it is it is not because it is not beautiful but it is slightly disturbing to someone inside why of course i won't miss benedict said marcia dropping her bow i wouldn't have done such a thing if i dreamed it would have disturbed any one it isn't it isn't that i don't love it stammered miss benedict for i do but it seems to be very upsetting to she hesitated just for a fraction of a moment and then seemed to take a sudden resolution to my sister she ended flusteringly as though the simple omission carried something damaging in it it required strong self-control for the three girls not to exchange glances oh i hope i haven't done her any harm cried marcia contritely no she it has just made her a little nervous she will be all right soon i trust but i notice that it has had the same effect before went on miss benedict i fear i shall have to ask you not not to play again in her hearing and i am very sorry for both cicely and myself 
and she retreated into the house again closing the door softly on the way back to the luncheon that noon the girls excitedly discussed the newest turn of affairs and the newest revelations made by their strange neighbor and so absorbed were they in this fresh interest and so anxious to impart it to aunt minerva that they scarcely noticed that she was laboring under a suppressed excitement quite as great as their own indeed she paid but scant attention to the recital and when they had finished her only comment was very odd very odd indeed but you can never guess about the news i have no no of course i can't guess tell us quick cried marcia impatiently it's something wonderful i know miss minerva made no reply but suddenly laid a wireless telegram before them marcia snapped it up and read aloud change of sailing plans will be home in two days edwin brett hurrah hurrah she cried father's coming a whole two months before we expected him now we'll hear something about the bracelet and who knows what will happen after that end of chapter thirteen via wireless chapter fourteen of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman the writing on the bracelets in the joy of seeing her father after months of absence marcia almost forgot the mystery of benedict's folly almost but not quite captain brett had been home twenty-four hours and had had time to give an account of all the intervening weeks before the subject was broached then the next morning with a great air of mystery the two girls and aunt minerva made him sit down and listen to the entire story at its conclusion they produced the two filigree bracelets for his inspection hm he exclaimed and whistling softly under his breath examined them with minute care and then being a man of few words he only remarked so you think these were once a pair why of course cried marcia don't you it looks remarkably like it he conceded do tell us how you happened to get yours she begged there's nothing much to tell replied captain brett happened to be in hong kong one day and a ragged-looking chinese sailor thrust this under my nose and whined that he would let me have it for two mexican dollars they're always trying to get rid of things like this when they want some spare cash one never knows where they pick them up i didn't want the trinket particularly but i saw it was a unique little piece and worth probably much more so i bought it tucked it away in my trunk and forgot it until i arrived home when i gave it to you minerva that's all i know about it how long ago was that asked janet must have been at least twelve years ago i'm not sure of the exact year but what do these things mean questioned miss minerva pointing to the strange character on the silver work they're chinese characters certainly but i don't know what they mean you see them on lots of their jewelry and gimcracks generally mean good luck or happiness or some such motto can't say whether these mean anything of that kind or not but tell me father don't you honestly believe that if we could get these translated find out what they mean it might give us some clue to the puzzle marcia appealed to him it might or it might not he answered skeptically so many of these characters might be meaningless as far as any personal application was concerned well anyway could we get them translated just for our own satisfaction demanded marcia nothing simpler smiled captain brett my boatswain is a chinese very learned man reads his confucius in off hours he'd be sure to help you with it oh goody and when can we have it done cried marcia aglow with anticipation well you're all coming down to the ship tomorrow bring the bracelets along and i'll see that li ching is on hand to give you his assistance but i warn you don't count too much on what you may discover from it i don't want you to have a bad disappointment in spite of which warning notwithstanding the girls slept little that night so excited were they over the prospect and when they did sleep dreamed impossible dreams mainly of quite unintelligible translations of cryptic chinese characters the visit to captain brett's ship the empress of oran would have been an event apart from any other interest involved in the expedition marcia and janet had never in their lives been on board an ocean steamer even the approach of it was fascinating the long covered wharfs with their strange spicy odors the bustle and activity of loading and unloading 
the narrow gangways the dark waist of the vessel and the immaculate white paint of the decks they examined every inch of the huge steamer from the stoking room to the donkey engines on the forecastle deck and spent a half an hour in the cosy tiny cabin that was the captain's own marveling at the compactness and handiness of every detail when they all went up to the after deck for luncheon which was served under an awning marcia and janet could scarcely eat for watching the deft silent sphinx-like chinese cook who waited on them they tasted strange dishes that day some of which like curry and rice were scarcely acceptable to their unaccustomed palates now said the captain in the middle of the meal if we were only out on the china sea or bowling along over the pacific this would be just right you'd have more of an appetite in that salt air than you do hemmed in by these noisy docks but it was not the docks that had stolen away the appetites of marcia and janet they were boiling with impatience to see the boatswain that student of confucius who could perhaps throw some new light on their mystery ambrosia and nectar for luncheon would scarcely have appealed to them under the circumstances at last however the meal was ended with the curious little chinese nuts whose meat was almost like a raisin then when the table was cleared and the captain had lit his cigar he spoke the word that caused their hearts to jump and their eyes to brighten now i suppose you want to see li ching he beckoned to a sailor and set him to find the boatswain li ching arrived with promptitude saluted his captain and stood gravely at attention he was not a young man and he had a decidedly oriental mask-like face it seemed strange that he should be dressed in the conventional boatswain uniform with peaked cap and the whistle of his office one could imagine him better in some brilliant hued wide-sleeved chinese garment with a long pigtail down his back li ching said the captain these two young ladies are very much interested in the two bracelets that have come into their possession the characters on them you see are in your language we wonder if you will be so kind as to translate them for us li ching took the trinkets and examined them minutely presently he asked will ladies have what to say by word of mouth the captain was about to answer yes and then changed his mind no it may be rather important and we will want to remember it accurately we would be obliged if you would write it out li ching nodded gravely will captain permit i retire to cabin he requested and on being dismissed he retreated with a formal bow but can he write english cried marcia when he had disappeared of course he can better than he can speak it laughed the captain english is child's play compared to that brain paralyzing language of his i must say though that li ching is rather unusual as chinese sailors go he studied in the university of pekin reads and writes english well and he never speaks pidgin english why he's spending his life as a boatswain of a trading steamer i don't know he's fitted for far different things but i have an idea it's on account of his health that he follows the sea the time before li ching's reappearance seemed to the girls indeterminable though in all probability it was not more than fifteen minutes at last however he returned laid the bracelets and a slip of paper in the captain's hand and was about to retire one moment said captain brett is the writing on the two bracelets the same words on two bracelets are identical replied li ching precisely that is all then and thank you and the captain dismissed him oh read it cried marcia or i shall die of impatience and she hung over his shoulders while he read aloud li ching's queer angular handwriting from the maker of melodies to the flower maiden on the day of their wedding amoy september twenty fifth eighteen eighty nine when he had finished a blank look crept over the expectant faces of the two girls is that all cried janet and marcia exclaimed why how disappointing it doesn't tell us a single thing wait a minute said the captain tugging thoughtfully at his short mustache while he studied the paper i am not so sure of that end of chapter fourteen the writing on the bracelets chapter fifteen of the girl next door by augusta ewell seaman puzzling it out 
to begin with captain brett went on after a long and to janet and marcia very trying pause we've something to hold on to in just the date september twenty fifth eighteen eighty nine and amoy what's amoy anyway demanded marcia it's a large seaport in the province of fu kien china and i've stopped there many a time myself then there's the date of this wedding somebody might possibly remember it there's just the faintest chance but there aren't any names given argued marcia and besides there must be hundreds of chinese weddings going on all the time i don't believe you could find any one who could remember just this particular one there are one or two things about this you don't understand marcia first place i'm almost certain that this isn't any chinese wedding referred to here the chinese don't do things that way i know a little about their customs it's english or american you can bank on that another thing about the names i'm pretty sure that this contains both names at least the ones the party went by in china you see the chinese have no equivalents in their language for such names as jones or robinson or brett for instance what they do is to take some characteristic of the person and give him the name signifying that characteristic i strongly suspect that whatever words in chinese stand for the maker of melodies and flower maiden were the names that the man and woman were known by there then interrupted janet who had been doing some rapid thinking the man must have been some kind of musician and the woman may have loved flowers or looked like a flower or something of that sort i think it's extremely likely agreed the captain maker of melodies musician cried marcia suddenly hopping up from her deck chair in excitement does that make you think of anything the captain and janet both looked rather mystified and shook their heads why cicely of course exclaimed marcia don't you remember how she adores music and always seems to be remembering something about that troy marie i warrant just anything that these people who got married were some relation to her and besides didn't she have one of the bracelets it looks as if you had run down a clue admitted captain brett but i'm sorry to say it doesn't help us much in discovering who these contracting parties were one point however i think it seems to settle the question whether the bracelet came into possession of your little friend in some such manner as i got the other or whether it was hers by right of a family trinket i believe the latter almost beyond question but now comes the difficulty how are we going to unearth anybody who has any remembrance of marcia suddenly inspired with an idea interrupted why not ask li ching he's chinese who knows but what he came from just that region nothing like trying said the captain i don't know what province he hails from but it won't hurt to ask and he sent the sailor to summon li ching once more when he appeared the captain put his first question li ching what province did you come from fu kien came the answer promptly and the girl's hopes were raised sky high did you ever live in amoy no never lived there always lived in hills back beyond well by any chance do you happen to know anything about the party spoken of in that bracelet translation no was out to sea at date mentioned young man then not very well on dry land must live on ship always or not live never acquainted with parties mentioned thank you that is all li ching the bright hopes of the girls were considerably dampened but marcia was not to be downed anyway she argued you've other chinese sailors on board why couldn't we question them all we might find some one who knows the captain was rather dubious about it yes the cook and four sailors are chinese you can question them if you like but i'm afraid it won't be much satisfaction they're an appallingly ignorant lot but i'll have them summoned in a few minutes the five were lined up and true to the captain's estimate a hopeless-looking lot they were after much confused questioning in pidgin english 
it developed that the cook and the two sailors were from the province of sanchi and a third from kian su and the two others from nowhere in particular that they could seem to remember none of them knew anything about amoy beyond the squalid shops about the wharfs the captain dismissed them all with a disgusted wave of his hand and turned to the girls you see how worse than useless it is to try and find out anything from such sources i knew it would be so but i didn't want to discourage you now you just leave me to myself for half an hour to smoke in peace and do a little thinking go and look at them unloading or roam about and amuse yourselves in any way you like perhaps if i rack my brains hard something will occur to me they left him pacing up and down the deck puffing on his cigar while they went to explore the great ship all over again but the occupation though fascinating failed to keep their thoughts from the latest phase of the queer mystery that surrounded cicely marlowe do you know said marcia as they stood looking down at the well of the vast engine-room it seems simply impossible to me to connect the lovely dainty english sicily with anything so oriental as china i can't understand it i can't imagine any connection can you no i can't admitted janet and more than that where does miss benedict come in on this chinese proposition nothing could be less connected with it than she i believe that she would have a fit if she ever saw that awful-looking crowd of chinese sailors your father had there a while ago did you ever see such a rascally-looking lot and poor little cicely would be horrified i liked li ching though he was so grave and serious and dignified and isn't his english fascinating i just love to hear him talk but oh i wish father hadn't sent us away for half an hour i can hardly wait for the time to pass let's go and look at those men on the dock unloading why do they make such a racket you'd think there was a fire or something so they whiled away the time and at last promptly on the minute raced back to captain brett well demanded marcia breathless what now just a happy thought the captain threw the stump of his finished cigar over the rail i have been trying to think of whom i could remember meeting in china during the past years some responsible person who might know these people or be able to track them down suddenly recalled old major goodrich he was an english military attache stationed at hong kong for a while and i got to know him rather well he was retired some years ago and the last i heard from him he was living in this country somewhere in pennsylvania with his only daughter who happened to have married an american if anybody were likely to know anything about this business it would be he for he knew everybody and everybody worth knowing about in amoy at the time i'll look up his address and write to him tonight. now i hope that satisfies you both father you're a trump cried marcia blissfully i knew you'd get right to the bottom of this mystery at once hold on don't count your chickens before they're hatched warned the captain this is only a possibility not a probability the major may know nothing whatever about it but look here it's high time we were heading for home we don't want to be late for dinner they reached the apartment bursting with news to tell aunt minerva but were met at the door by that lady flushed flustered and very much excited such a state of affairs she cried an hour ago i received a telegram from cousin drusilla and northam saying that she was very ill indeed and wouldn't i come up at once as she is virtually all alone of course i've got to go i can't leave her there sick without a soul to look after her but what on earth are you all going to do oh go right along minerva the girls and i will get along famously they can try their hand at housekeeping and you've a good maid in the kitchen to help don't you worry a minute yes but began aunt minerva you've got just fifteen minutes to catch the boston express said the captain decisively looking at his watch give me that suitcase and come right along aunt minerva who had really been all packed and ready for the past twenty-nine minutes meekly obeyed i won't be gone more than a few days she remarked and kissed the girls good-bye i'll get some one to take my place with drusilla just as soon as i can don't let eliza boil the corn too long and tell her 
the sentence was never finished for the captain at that point gently but firmly led her into the hall and closed the door and though the girls suspected it not this sudden departure of aunt minerva had more bearing on the mystery they were trying to solve than any of them dreamed end of chapter fifteen puzzling it out chapter sixteen of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman one mystery explained meantime cicely marlowe immured in the lonely house had been having an experience all her own and when the girls came to see her the day after the visit to the ship she too was bursting with news but she quietly waited till they had told their own tale and was as puzzled as they about the strange translation of the characters on the bracelet of anything pertaining to china or the chinese she had not the remotest notion and could not understand how it could have any connection with her affairs now you must hear my story she began when they had discussed the newest development till there was nothing left to discuss it's about miss benedict she has but just wait and i'll begin at the beginning it was two nights ago and she had one of those headaches she has such very bad ones you know she says they are from her poor eyesight and she suffers terribly well she had a worse one than usual and so she was obliged to call me into her room and ask me to fetch things for her i sat by her and bathed her head and fanned her and at last she fell asleep even then i didn't go away but i sat there fanning and fanning her for a long time till finally after a couple of hours she woke up she was very much better then and presently she began to talk to me quite differently from what she ever had before first she asked me if i were contented and happy here i said i tried to be but i was very lonesome sometimes she didn't say much to that but suddenly she spoke again child i suppose you wonder very much about this queer life i lead don't you i said yes i couldn't help wondering about it then she turned her head away and whispered oh if you only knew you would not wonder i have been very unhappy my life has been very unhappy all i could think of to answer her was that i was so sorry and she need not tell me anything she didn't wish to i would never ask about it and she raised herself up in bed and said that's just it dear child i have always supposed that young folk were one and all curious inquisitive and thoughtless that is one reason i was so so strict with you in the beginning but you and those two nice girls next door have been a revelation to me wasn't that lovely of her exclaimed cicely interrupting herself just darling cried marcia but do go on cicely we're crazy to hear what came next well next she said people think i live a very singular life i know they think i'm eccentric queer crazy even oh i know it but there are few alive to-day and none in this neighbourhood who even guess at the real reason who remember and then she put her hand to her head as if it was aching badly and dropped back on the pillow she was very quiet for a while but at last she looked up again and said little cicely would you care to have a home with me always would you be willing to put up with my queerness and peculiarities and some of the strange conditions here and i answered indeed yes if i could go out once in a while and visit you girls occasionally i should very much like to stay and she said of course you shall dear you have been dreadfully shut in here but that was before i knew you so well i was not sure i wanted to keep you before but now i know i do i only ask you to be as considerate of me as you can some day i feel certain i shall lose my sight i know that it is coming when it does come i shall have to depend very very much on you i and one other you will not fail me then will you cicely girls i could have cried then and there i felt so sorry for her and when i told her she could always depend on me no matter what happened i had no other home and no one else to care for me except you girls and after that she told me the story about herself at least some of it i can't tell it in her words so i'll use my own but this is it a great many years ago when this house was new 
She lived here with her father and an older sister and a younger brother. They were all very happy together, and the brother was the pride and joy and hope of the whole family. But one time he had a violent disagreement with his father. She didn't tell me what it was about. And she and her sister took sides with the father against the brother. After that they had the same disagreement a great many times, and at last one so bad that the young man declared that he wouldn't endure it any longer, and threatened to leave home. But they didn't believe that he was really serious about it. But the next morning his room was vacant, and a note pinned to his pillow said that he had gone away, never to return. They felt awfully about it, of course, but that wasn't the worst. About two weeks later they received word that he had taken passage on a steamer for Europe, and after only a day or so out, he was discovered to be missing. So he must have fallen overboard, or been washed over and drowned. Wasn't that frightful? Janet and Marcia looked horrified. What did she do then? they whispered. That's the most dreadful part, went on Cicely. The shock was so great that the father died a week afterwards. The doctor said virtually of a broken heart. So there were two gone, and within a month. The two that were left, Miss Benedict and her sister, shut themselves up and went into mourning, and saw almost no one. For a while they were paralyzed with grief, and then, little by little, very gradually, they began to realize that people were talking about them, saying dreadful things. One of the few friends they did see let drop little hints of the gossip that was going on outside. People were saying that they were to blame for it all and that they probably weren't so sorry as they pretended to be. For now they could enjoy all the money themselves. Can you imagine anything so horrid? But that's nonsense, interrupted Janet impatiently. How could anyone say it was their fault? Well, you know how people talk, replied Cicely. They meant that by nagging and quarreling they had driven the brother away on purpose, and then made it so unpleasant for the father that he couldn't stand it any longer either. It wasn't said in so many words, but just little hints and allusions and shrugging shoulders and all that sort of thing. But the meaning was there underneath it all, plain as anything. Their grief and the horrid talk about them made them feel so very badly that they determined to live in such a way that no one could accuse them of enjoying ill-gotten fortune so they shut up the house, at least a large part of it, and dismissed all of their servants and did most of the work themselves. After a while, the few friends they had began to drop away, one by one, till no one came to see them any more. And then one day, two or three years later, the older sister had a paralytic stroke and lost her memory. She's been shut up in that room ever since, and Miss Benedict takes care of her. She can sit up in a chair and knit, and she likes to have the chessboard on her lap, and moves the pieces around, because she once loved to play the game with her younger brother. But she can't remember anything, not even who she is herself, and nothing about what has happened. Miss Benedict feels terribly about her, especially about her not remembering anything, and she says that is why she didn't tell me about it at first. It seems so terrible. She says all the friends and relatives they had are dead and gone now, so no one knows the real reason for their queer life. And as the years have passed, she has grown more and more into the habit of living this way till it seemed quite natural to her. At least it did till I came, and now she is beginning to realize again that it is queer. And she was so afraid of gossip and talk that when you first wanted to be friends with me, she would not allow it, for fear of starting more unpleasant inquiries into her life. But what about her poor eyes? asked Janet. Oh, yes. About ten years ago she began having those terrible pains in her eyes, and then she had to darken all the house and wear the veil and dark glasses outdoors. She went to a doctor about them, but was told that the case was hopeless, unless she had some complicated operation and spent months in a dark room. She felt that she couldn't do this on account of her sister, whom she would not leave to a stranger's care. So she has just suffered ever since. 
that's all girls except that she told me her sister's name is cornelia and that hers is alexi i am to call her miss alexi after this it makes her seem a little nearer to me what a pretty name alexi commented marcia it just seems to suit her somehow but isn't that the saddest story it just goes to show how unhappy we can make people by talking about them and their affairs and oh there's one more thing miss benedict i mean miss alexi gave me permission to tell you all of this but she only asks that you will not repeat it except to your father and aunt she says she knows you can be depended on to do this that day before janet and marcia left they encountered miss benedict in the hall and by the way she pressed their hands in saying good-bye they felt that she knew cicely had told them her story though she made no reference to it cicely may run in and visit you a while to-morrow i think the change will do her good she remarked at parting and that was the only hint that she gave of the change in affairs of benedict's folly when janet and marcia were at last outside the gate they gazed up at the forbidding brick wall and drew a long breath of wonder so that is the story breathed marcia what an awful thing that two people's lives should be spoiled just by unkind gossip but janet was thinking of something else i wonder why miss benedict didn't tell what the family had the disagreement about she queried End of chapter 16 One Mystery Explained Chapter 17 of The Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman Major Goodrich Assists During the week following Aunt Minerva's departure, the two girls had a busy life, taking charge of the unaccustomed tasks of housekeeping. But with all their absorbing occupations, the three were waiting on tiptoe of expectation for the reply from Major Goodrich and even captain brett could scarcely conceal his impatience as the days went by and no answer came at last one morning the mailbox contained a letter postmarked from pennsylvania and marcia carried it upstairs two steps at a time it was from the major he wrote is there any way that you can think of to furnish me with an idea of what the chinese for that expression maker of melodies sounds like the only way that occurs to me is to see whether by any faint chance li ching could write it in that romanized colloquial used by the missionaries that might give me an idea it's a hundred chances to one he doesn't know it if so just spell it out for me yourself in english the nearest you can get to it the reason i want to know is this there was a young fellow in hong kong at the british military station a military aide of promise who had a magnificent singing voice everyone went wild over him there he was the life of the garrison and in social circles as well many an evening we spent listening to one of his impromptu recitals but what makes me suspect that he may be the one that we're after is that he foolishly went and married the daughter of a chinese mandarin from one of the hong kong yamens he had been the means of rendering the father of some very important service and met the daughter quite by accident the whole affair was a rather remarkable story but i haven't time to detail it all to you now i saw the girl just once afterward she was a fascinating little creature with the golden butterfly pins and her black hair and her rich silk robe hung with jewels and her tiny bound feet but the young fellow's family back in england was furious about it eventually he cut loose from them entirely then he and his wife drifted away from the hong kong region up to amoy and finally dropped out of sight i imagine he adopted the chinese customs and habits and got to live at last very much like a native i've never heard of him since but i've a notion that he could be hunted up if he's still alive his name was carringford jack carringford we used to call him the point however is that the chinese called him by a name of their own signifying eminent singer or something of that sort very much the same kind of expression as that used on the bracelet and after a while we all got to calling him by it or some abbreviation of it pretty regularly i can't recall just what it is now 
for i haven't thought of it in years but i believe i would recognize it if i saw it written out in colloquial or any other english version get me that and i'll soon put you on the right track mightn't the little girl possibly be the daughter of carringford no she mightn't interrupted marcia indignantly at this point does cicely marlowe look like a chinese mandarin's daughter's daughter and certainly with her golden curls and big blue eyes and english roses in her cheeks they had to admit that she did not and besides that added janet her name isn't carringford that doesn't always signify remarked the captain it looks to me like a rather clear case if we can find that the chinese name agrees with the major's recollection of it i'd go down to the ship to-day but li ching is on shore leave and won't be back till to-morrow i'll see him then and find out whether he knows anything about this romanized colloquial i rather doubt it myself it's not much used outside of the missions i understand what is romanized colloquial anyway demanded marcia it sounds very mysterious no it's not a bit mysterious answered captain brett in order to understand about it however you must know this fact about the chinese language the written character is the same means the same all over the kingdom but it isn't pronounced the same in any of the different provinces in fact the spoken dialects are like entirely different languages it seems that the dialect of the fukien province has been reduced to a written form by the missionaries and called romanized colloquial it has been used for a good many years but it isn't especially recognized by official or diplomatic circles but a good many of the chinese boys who attended the mission schools learn it there it's just possible that li ching may have done so as he came from that region we can only wait and see if he doesn't know it he may be able to write out the chinese equivalent in some form of english script the next day the captain went down to the empress of oran and returned with a beaming face and a sheet of paper written on by li ching he knew it all right he announced learned it as a boy in the mission school at chiang chu here's what he wrote and he held the sheet of paper for the girls to see he's put the chinese characters on one side they have to be read from top to bottom you know next to them is the romanized colloquial and alongside that the english translation quite a pretty piece of work that gracious cried marcia frowning over the queer jargon i can't make a thing out of it or at least i couldn't if he hadn't put the english right along with the others oh this must be the name chock long maker of melodies did you ever hear such heathenish sounds well now we'll see what major goodrich has to say to that father will you send it right off to him at once announced the captain i'm just about as anxious as you folks now to get this mystery explained but the singular thing was that somehow the girls could not bring themselves to tell cicely much about these latest developments they thought it would make her feel strange and anxious to realize that there was a possibility of her being in any way related to a chinese mandarin's daughter and besides remarked janet suddenly when they were discussing it that's perfectly impossible anyway because her mother was english and cicely has lived with her all these years so this talk about mandarin's daughters and things is perfectly ridiculous that's so echoed marcia in relief i didn't think of it at first but anyway let's not tell cicely about it until we know more i do wish aunt minerva were here i haven't written her all about this because there's so much to explain i'd rather wait and tell her when she gets back she said that she was only going to be gone a little while and here it's nearly two weeks in three days an answer arrived from the major and as luck would have it cicely herself brought the letter upstairs with her as she came in 
the postman was just going to drop it in your box she explained and i asked him to let me take it to you and save you the trouble of coming down for it and she held it out to the captain aha he cried as he caught sight of the writing now we'll hear some news why what's the matter he had just glimpsed marcia and janet frantically signaling to him behind cicely's back don't you want me to open it oh not now explained marcia as nonchalantly as she could i want cicely to come out to the kitchen and help us make some fudge later will do and she dragged the wandering cicely down the hall while the captain stared after them muttering well of all the cicely stayed rather late that afternoon and for the first time in all their acquaintance the girls were not sorry to have her go so wild with anxiety they were to hear the major's letter no sooner had the door closed upon her than they rushed back to the captain what does he say they clamored end of chapter seventeen major goodrich assists chapter eighteen of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman the major has a further inspiration the captain who was puffing at his pipe appeared serious i don't like the looks of this thing at all he muttered reaching it in his pocket for the letter but what did he say tell us quick cried marcia we've been nearly crazy there in the kitchen waiting to have cicely go so we could hear what he says well i'm glad she did go first acknowledged the captain for somehow i wouldn't care to have her hear just yet what the major has to say he thinks but i'll read his letter and you can understand what i mean here it is about the chinese name first the one you sent certainly does have a familiar sound to me especially the last two syllables i distinctly remember that the name jack carringford was called by in an inn elang or something that sounded amazingly like it i wouldn't bank on that entirely however for the chinese language is the most confusing and idiotic jargon ever invented by the mind of man and there might be a dozen other words ending the same and meaning something entirely different here's a fact more to the point though since writing to you last i've been busy communicating with several old chums of the china days what i've been trying to find out is does anyone know what has become of carringford by the third year after his unfortunate marriage he had pretty well dropped out of sight still i thought i knew of one or two who might have kept some track of him even after that one of them danforth pettingill an old chum of jack's is now living in new york and i thought he'd probably know as much as anyone so i wrote to him at the very start and yesterday received this answer it seems that carringford and his wife lived with her father for some time till about two years after their marriage when a little daughter was born then the old mandarin who was fearfully annoyed because the baby was not a boy girls being of no earthly account in china as you know made it so unpleasant for the couple that they finally left his establishment it was then that they began their roaming existence terribly hampered by the baby of course and never remaining long in any city at last the wife contracted the plague and died very suddenly and carringford was left alone with the baby on his hands it was at this time that he dropped completely out of sight and pettingill never heard from him again he thinks however from a very substantial rumor that carringford went back to england taking the child with him he didn't go to his own folks though that's certain for pettingill has heard from them occasionally and they never mention him there was another rumor afloat about him for a time that he had taken to earning his living by singing at cheap concerts under an assumed name all of which might be entirely likely but what became of the child pettingill never knew nor anyone else i'm afraid well that's all i've ascertained up to date but i am still on the track and if i hear any further news i will let you know at once when the captain stopped reading all of them looked very serious and no one said a word for several minutes you see he began at last why i don't like the looks of the thing it seems to cover almost all the points we've been in doubt about though of course it does leave quite a little to conjecture 
i somehow dislike to think of little cicely as a mixture of chinese and english in fact it's almost impossible to think of her as such and yet it seems remarkably near the truth if that man assumed a name interrupted marcia i suppose it might as easily be marlow as anything else just as easily admitted captain brett and he went back to england just where cicely came here from added janet lugubriously but then why doesn't cicely remember something about him cried marcia hopefully he may have been dead a good while or he may have sent her off somewhere else answered the captain dashing this hope he wouldn't be likely to drag a child about in any such life as he must have had to lead they all sank into a depressed silence again suddenly marcia had another idea but look here she exclaimed major goodrich says that the man was at hong kong and the bracelet says amoy as plain as plain can be isn't that enough proof that it can't be the same one again the captain had to dampen her hopes they might have gone to amoy to be married he said it's entirely possible you can't tell anything about that and besides put in janet you got the bracelet in hong kong didn't you captain brett so if it really belonged to those people it was still pretty near home well it is useless to conjecture about these things added the captain what bothers me most of all is the question of what earthly connection all of this can have with miss benedict there doesn't seem to be the least likelihood that the carringfords were any relation of hers and unless cicely was simply sent here on chance because it was known that she was a wealthy woman and might be willing to provide for the child i'm quite at a loss to explain it i wonder if there's any way we could find out mused marcia i know a very good way declared janet simply ask her what and explain all the strange business about cicely's parents right away demanded marcia oh no just ask her if she ever had any connections in england named carringford she'll either say yes or no to that and if she says yes why then we'll know we're on the right track and can think what to do next janet's advice is pretty good asserted captain brett and if i were you i would put the question to miss benedict the next time you see her it's about the only way i can think of now to solve this riddle and so it was decided that the very next day when the girls expected to go and visit cicely they should ask miss benedict the dread question cicely met them at the gate the next afternoon oh i'm so glad you've come she cried i'm really very lonely miss benedict is going to be away all afternoon because she has some business to attend to she says we can sit in the garden at this piece of news the girls faces fell why what's the matter questioned cicely don't you care to i thought you'd be rather pleased indeed it will be fine declared marcia striving to hide her disappointment at the news that miss benedict would not be visible that day she and janet had counted so positively on having one at least of their vexed questions settled immediately that it was difficult to feel that they must wait two or three days more for on the morrow cicely was to visit them as they now spent alternate days at each other's houses and on the day after captain brett had promised to take the three of them on a trip up the hudson all that afternoon however marcia and janet were noticeably inattentive and absent-minded once marcia who was reading aloud to the others stopped short in the middle of a sentence and remained for three whole minutes gazing off at nothing and at this cicely could contain her wonder no longer girls are you by any chance annoyed at me she ventured marcia suddenly dragged herself back to the affairs of the moment of course not dearie how could you think such a thing she declared heartily then something else is the matter insisted cicely you are worrying about something i never knew you to act so strangely now tell me aren't you marcia glanced uneasily at janet well yes we are she admitted reluctantly but please don't ask us anything about it just yet cicely something that has come up lately seems kind of queer and and unpleasant but it may turn out to be all right in the end so we don't want to tell you until we know positively cicely looked alarmed is it is it anything to do about me she faltered but perhaps i oughtn't to ask 
Marcia looked terribly unhappy at this question, and Janet came to her rescue. Yes, it is, Cicely, she declared with assumed cheerfulness. Captain Brett has stumbled across something that seems as if it might have some connection with your affairs, but we don't want you to hear about it until we are positive. Now don't worry about it, because I am perfectly certain everything is going to turn out all right. You won't worry, will you? She put her arm around Cicely and laid her cheek against the golden hair. No, I'll try not to, Cicely assured them. And I promise not to ask you another thing about it till you are ready to tell me yourselves. After that, she settled down quietly. But it was apparent to the girls that, in spite of her assurances, she was worried and nervous and unhappy. Presently, Janet had an inspiration. You two sit here. I'm going out for a few moments, she announced determined to break the tension of unrest and nervousness by some diversion nor would she reveal to them what her errand was to be she returned in twenty minutes however with a box of delicious french ice cream and some dainty cakes and for the next half hour they had a gay time in the garden serving and consuming the welcome treat in the end they had temporarily quite forgotten the unhappiness of the earlier hour and when they returned home the two girls left cicely laughing and cheerful nor did she all through the ensuing two days refer in any way to their conversation in the garden if the matter worried her she gave no sign and the girls could not help admiring her self-control three days later marcia and janet went again to spend the afternoon with cicely and found to their relief that miss benedict was at home at least they learned the fact from cicely the lady herself they did not see when they entered and indeed there was a chance that they might not have so much of a glimpse of her during their visit for it frequently happened that she was not visible during an entire afternoon would she speak to them that day that was the question and what was even more important would they have a chance to speak to her unobserved by cicely for they did not wish the girl to overhear what they had to ask nor even to know that they were seeking an interview with her guardian for the major part of the afternoon it did not seem as if their wish would be granted miss benedict did not appear and so nervous and anxious they were that they could scarcely keep their thoughts on the conversation that cicely was striving to keep up or later on the book that they were reading cicely had declared that her room seemed very warm so they were sitting once more in the garden this also was a disappointment for it lessened considerably their chances of seeing the lady of their hopes half past five came round and still they had not attained their wish marcia had just risen with a resigned sigh to propose that they take their departure when the side door opened and miss benedict appeared at the sight of her the hearts of marcia and janet gave a delighted thump and they greeted her with a pleasure the warmth of which she could not entirely understand but now came the problem of getting cicely out of the way for a time it was evident that she had no intention of leaving them on her own accord and it was marcia's happy idea that solved this riddle cicely she suddenly inquired did you happen to finish that book i lent you last week oh yes i finished it last night i meant to return it to-day said cicely wait a moment and i'll get it from my room you must be anxious to finish it yourself i know and she hurried indoors unconscious of the unutterable relief with which they watched her go when she was out of sight marcia turned to miss benedict please pardon me for asking a personal question she began hurriedly but it is only because we think that it is something that concerns cicely did you ever have in england or anywhere any relatives or or even friends by the name of carringford miss benedict was bonneted and veiled as usual so they could not see her face and they would have given much to have been able to read her expression when she heard this question but she answered very promptly and positively no i never knew of any one at all by that name why do you ask they could hear cicely's footsteps returning down the stairs only because we have discovered something in connection with the people of that name which seems to concern cicely marcia explained hastily some time we will tell you about it we thought perhaps you'd know them please please don't tell cicely we have spoken about it just yet miss benedict only had time to signify that she would follow their request when cicely appeared in the doorway and the interview was over as they walked home later they both admitted to a feeling of intense relief that miss benedict at least knew nothing about any caringfords of course her not knowing them doesn't prove anything declared janet 
but one thing is certain if she had known them it would have been positive that all this horrid story is connected with cicely but as she does it it gives one more chance that it has nothing to do with her as they entered the hall of the apartment the captain called out to them from the living room hurry in girls there's another letter from the major waiting for you end of chapter eighteen the major has a further inspiration chapter nineteen of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman chapter nineteen the unexpected the major's letter did nothing however to lighten the gloom on the contrary it only increased it tenfold the main substance of it was in this paragraph it's singular how much you can dig out about a subject once you put your mind to it i thought at first i had told you all that was known about jack carringford and his affairs all that could be discovered but the deeper i go into it the more i seem to unearth yesterday another friend to whom i had written on the off chance of getting a little information but from whom i didn't really expect much sent me this bit of news it seems he heard it said that after carringford went back to england he married again and it is thought that he did not live long after died suddenly of pneumonia or something like it in an obscure town in the north of england perhaps this will help you in some of your amateur detective work if i glean any more information i'll let you know at once i rather enjoy this delving into the past oh horrors exclaimed marcia could anything be plainer than this is getting to be of course that explains it all cicely didn't remember her father and her mother was really her stepmother i wonder if she knows it she never mentioned it but then she seldom speaks of her mother anyway though i always thought from the way she acted that she was very fond of her it certainly grows more convincing with every added piece of news we hear mused the captain i wish we could find some loophole for thinking that this tangle doesn't concern cicely but how on earth she can have any chinese ancestry beats me she doesn't show a trace of it one would certainly think that she'd have almond eyes and coarse straight hair or a dark complexion or something it's the one thing that gives me the slightest hope that she can't be carringford's daughter but what shall we do now questioned janet breaking the back abruptly to the affairs of the moment the first thing to do declared captain brett is to question cicely about her father and mother and see what she knows she may recall something that will give us another clue if this proves to be the right trail we've got to follow it up get into communication with the carringfords in england and see if they'll do anything about her they ought to be willing to provide for his daughter but we'll have to be very sure of our facts or they'll pay no attention i suppose somehow or other we'll have to trace out carringford's career in england after he returned i wish i knew the name he assumed but no one seems to be able to tell us that but even still we haven't the slightest clue to the reason why cicely was sent to miss benedict mused marcia why yes we have something new now interrupted janet hasn't it occurred to you that mr carringford's second wife might have been some connection of the benedicts or known them or something sure enough sure enough cried the captain thumping his knee this puts the thing in an entirely new light we must find out a little more about that second wife you get what you can from cicely but do be careful how you question her the child is sensitive and was apparently very fond of the lady she called her mother try not to probe too deeply and remember to explain to her that you are not asking just out of idle curiosity which she'd be perfectly right in resenting it was with no pleasant anticipations that marcia and janet looked forward to their interview with cicely next afternoon how to approach the subject without giving her a clue to the real state of affairs they were puzzled to know plan after plan they formed only to reject after thinking them over suppose cicely should ask this or what if cicely should inquire why we say that spoiled every outline of the conversation that they could imagine at last janet declared it's perfectly useless to think now what we'll say or what she'll answer let's just wait till the time comes and say what seems best at the moment the whole conversation may be entirely different from anything we plan i guess you're right sighed marcia i'm tired out thinking about it anyhow 
and so they put it all aside till cicely's arrival when she came that afternoon she found two very serious and thoughtful friends awaiting her one thing at least they had determined not to put off the dreaded interview till later in the day but have it over at once and get it off their minds so when they were all comfortably seated in marcia's cosy room janet began cicely would you mind very much if we ask you a few questions you remember the other day we said that something had come up concerning you we thought and we would tell you about it later well we aren't quite ready to tell you all about it yet but it would help a great deal if you'd answer a few questions about yourself will you and she felt an immense sensation of relief after these words were spoken at having at least taken the first plunge why of course assented cicely wonderingly that is if i possibly can and you'll remember that we are asking just out of curiosity but because it may help to untangle your affairs interrupted marcia anxiously cicely only smiled and squeezed her hand as if an answer to that were unnecessary well dear said janet in a hesitating voice could you tell us whether you know this was your father ever married twice cicely started and flushed a little oh i i don't know anything about such a thing she murmured i i don't think so you see he died before i remember anything about him and my mother never spoke of him to me very much then she never told you anything about that went on janet no replied cicely very positively now i have one more question to ask that i'm afraid may startle you but please don't attach too much importance to it was the lady you called your mother your real mother or your stepmother this time cicely fairly jumped oh no no she cried i'm sure i'm very sure she was my own mother she would have certainly have told me if she had not been i would have known it why do you ask that you know is what we can't just explain yet answered janet evidently distressed were you very very fond of her cicely indeed yes replied the puzzled girl how could i help but be she was so lovely and sweet and good to me and seemed to live only for my comfort and happiness i never dreamed of such a thing as her not being my own mother there were real tears in cicely's eyes as she made this declaration marcia and janet experienced as unpleasant a sensation as if they had been compelled to torture a helpless kitten and yet the task must be gone through with and there were further quarries to make do forgive us all of this cicely begged marcia it hurts us horribly to make you feel badly we wouldn't do it for the world if there were a good reason but can you tell us this was there anything your mother ever said or did that would in any way suggest that she might not be your own mother think hard cicely dear the girl sat a long while chin in hand staring out of the window at the tightly shuttered expanse of benedict's folly opposite no one spoke and the others made a vain pretense of working hard at their embroidery but the hands of both shook so that the stitches were very very crooked indeed at last cicely turned to them and spoke in a very subdued voice these things are making me very unhappy but i know you only mean them for my good my mother did say one or two things that i thought nothing of at the time but now since your questions seem as if they may have had another meeting one was this we were looking in the mirror together one time and i said how queer it was that i didn't look a bit like her i was so fair and light-haired and had rosy cheeks and she was dark and her eyes were brown and her hair almost black she smiled and said no it isn't very strange when you think and then stopped very suddenly and flushed quite red and i asked her what she meant but she only replied oh nothing nothing dear children often look very different from their parents not at all like them and she wouldn't say any more i thought it strange for a while but i soon forgot all about it i can't imagine now what she meant unless it was that the only other thing i remember is this i asked her one time whether when i was a tiny little baby i wore pink or blue bows on my dresses she was very busy about something at the time and she just said sort of absent-mindedly oh i don't know i'm sure and then she added in a great hurry oh i don't remember pink i guess 
I thought it strange that she would forget how she dressed me, for she always had a very good memory. But I forgot about that, too, very soon. That is all. Marcia and Janet glanced uneasily at each other. The information seemed to confirm their worst apprehensions, but Janet went on. Just one more question, dear, and we'll stop this horrid inquisition. Can you tell us what was your mother's maiden name, the name of her people? Yes, said Cicely. It was Treadwell. But she hadn't any people left. They were all dead. And she was the last of her family. But, oh, can't you tell me, girls, why have you had to ask all these questions? I have waited so patiently, and I have worried so about it all. And what you have said today has made me feel worse than ever. Dear heart, we don't want to tell you quite yet, soothed Marcia. It wouldn't do you any good to know about it till we're positive beyond a doubt. There isn't anything so terrible anyhow, nothing to worry about at all, but just something we wish might be a little different, and nothing could possibly make the least difference in the way we care for you anyway. So just don't worry another bit. Now I'm going to play for you. And she drew her violin from its case. Marcia gave them quite a concert that afternoon, rendering selection after selection to please them, glad indeed for the diversion and relief from the unpleasantness of their accomplished task. But she did not play the Troy Marie, for some reason not very well defined even to herself, but vaguely connected with recent disclosures. At last Cicely herself asked for it, and then, of course, Marcia could not refrain from obliging her. When it was over, Cicely took her departure, and the girls, left alone, plunged at once into discussion of the most recent developments of the mystery. That evening, Captain Brett and the two girls held a council of war. There's no denying, he said. We've discovered the most important thing yet in learning that name, Treadwell. We've something to work from now. With that to start from, I can set on foot some inquiries over in England that may establish her identity, and you must ask Miss Benedict, though I hate to be constantly troubling her in this way, if she has any recollection of someone by that name who could possibly have any claim on her. Do this as soon as possible. We're certain to get at the root of the matter very soon now. Do you think, asked Marcia, that those remarks of her mother's that Cicely repeated look as if we were right in believing it to be her stepmother. It certainly seems so to me, he acknowledged. Of course we must remember this. When you have a suspicion that certain things are so, every little circumstance and every lightest remark seem to confirm you in that belief. Often these things have absolutely no bearing on it whatever, but you think they have simply because you have a fear that they have or want them to have so we mustn't be misled by chance remarks i will admit however that these particular ones seem singularly to bear us out in our conjectures well do let us get some of these things settled tomorrow sighed marcia i am losing so much sleep over it that i'm beginning to feel like an owl i just worry and worry all night long it seems to me Let's ask Miss Benedict about the name of Treadwell when we go there, if we can possibly manage to see her. I am sorry to disappoint you about that, interrupted the captain, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to remain at home tomorrow. I am due downtown on some errands that will take me a number of places. At the same time, I'm expecting an important business message over the telephone. I shall have to ask you to be here without fail to take the message for me. I can't trust Eliza to get it right. So you'll have to put off your visit for another day. But don't be too much disappointed, for while I'm away, I shall be making inquiries as to how we must go about tracing the name of Treadwell in England. That will be something accomplished. And with this consolation, the girls had to be content. Now, said Janet, next morning, when the captain had gone, and they had resigned themselves to a long day of waiting. I have a plan to propose. Let's not talk or even think a thing about all this business today. If we do, we'll only make ourselves more miserable than we are. I found a perfectly fascinating new book in the library yesterday. Let's sit and read it, turn about, and see if we can't both finish those centerpieces we've been working on so long. We'll have to work like everything to do it. 
that ought to keep our minds off of our troubles and we'll telephone for some french pastry for dessert at luncheon and some candy for this afternoon the plan seemed to offer pleasant possibilities and they both settled themselves comfortably in the cool living room to pass the morning the book was well begun and the embroidery advancing rapidly when eliza came in with a letter just left in the box and deposited it on the library table it's for the captain she announced as she turned away marcia jumped up and scrutinized the writing oh janet she exclaimed at once it's from the major it is cried her friend apprehensively then it's some more horrid news he's unearthed i'm certain of it not a letter comes from him but it's something to worry us more i just hate the sight of them yes and what's more moaned marcia we can't even know what's in this one until father comes home this evening why i feel as if i'd go crazy having to wait all that time well you'll have to wait commented janet philosophically so you might as well do it as peacefully as you can come let's go on with our book it was all very well to speak philosophically about the matter however but to act so was a different affair try as they might they could not from that moment concentrate their minds on the pleasant program they had mapped out for themselves a dozen times during that morning marcia would stop reading and glance speculatively at the unopened letter a dozen times janet left her fancy work and strolled over to inspect the superscription anew the french pastry at luncheon failed to soothe them and the candy in the afternoon remained uneaten at three o'clock they took to staring out the window to watch for the captain's return and as they watched they detailed to each other the various things they surmised might be in the major's letter marcia asserted that he had probably discovered that the second wife's name to be treadwell thus confirming their worst fears and janet declared that he had no doubt ascertained just why cicely had been sent to the benedict home perhaps it was even to prevent her from being sent back to china to her mandarin grandfather nothing they could imagine was too dreadful to fit into the scheme of things by half past five they were the most miserable pair of girls in the big city and at that moment they heard the captain's key in the hall door quick 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 they breathlessly panted at him explaining nothing but only waving the major's letter in his face asking no questions he took it slid it open and glanced hurriedly through the contents and then he gave a long low whistle oh tell us groaned marcia what more that's horrible has he found out for the answer the captain sat down and laughed till tears stood in his eyes at last he managed to gasp well of all the dances i've been led this is the worst and most foolish but it's just like the major he always was the most impulsive chap you'll be delighted to know that he's made one more discovery and that is that he's been barking up the wrong tree as they say here's what he writes it occurred to me yesterday in connection with this affair to look up some of the old diaries i used to keep in the china days they have been stored away in the attic in a chest for years but i got them out and i have been running over them hoping to come across an entry that might have some bearing on the matter in question and quite to my chagrin i did discover this i will quote it just as it stands to-day carringford was married according to native customs none of us invited but here's the point of departure so to speak this entry was made on march tenth eighteen ninety and you see it doesn't agree at all with the inscription on your bracelet which is i believe september twenty fifth eighteen eighty nine so of course the only inference that can be drawn is that they were two separate and distinct affairs that have absolutely no connection so sorry anything else i can do for you i'll be delighted etc etc the captain did not finish the remainder of the letter for the excellent reason that no one in his audience was paying the least attention to it when he looked up at this point marcia was prone on the couch alternately sobbing and laughing and sobbing again and janet was staring out the window blinking hard to restrain the tears of relief that would insist on rolling down her cheeks and in the midst of this curious state of affairs who should open the door and walk in but aunt minerva suitcase in hand 
she stared at the three in amazement for a second till with a glad cry of recognition they all rushed upon her and literally snowed her under with embraces i couldn't let you know i was coming because i didn't know myself till this morning she explained drusilla's sister ellen came in unexpectedly from the west and of course that relieved me i just packed up in a half an hour and here i am whatever is the matter with you all when i came in you looked as if you had just attended the funeral of your last friend i hope eliza hasn't given you all indigestion we'll tell you after dinner minerva laughed the captain it's a long and complicated tale my but we're glad to see you again that evening they made her sit down and listen while they rehearsed the story it had to begin with the description of their day on the shipboard the very day that she had gone away and ended with the major's final letter she listened to it very quietly and without any comment whatever except for an indignant and scornful sniff once in a while well demanded marcia when it was over and they were waiting for her to speak what do you think of it i think she remarked cryptically that you needed minerva brett here to manage this affair for you she would have given you a little better advice than to go off on a wild goose chase down to pennsylvania on the wrong trail they stared at her in open-mouthed amazement you might explain yourself minerva mildly suggested the captain i might but i'm not going to she replied firmly at least not just at present and with a tantalizing smile she sweetly bade them all good night and departed to her room janet said marcia that night as she curled her arms up over her head on the pillow isn't it heavenly to go to sleep with that horrid weight lifted from your mind we seem to be just as far as ever from solving the riddle about sicily but at least the darling isn't the granddaughter of a mandarin but do you know i can't help but wonder where that poor little granddaughter is what became of her she sort of seems like a real person to me now i don't wonder about her and what's more i don't care sighed janet as long as it wasn't cicely what's puzzling me is how your aunt expects to solve the riddle what can she know about it well i don't bother about that returned marcia because i'm glad to let somebody else have a hand in working it out now i'm content to leave it to aunt minerva end of chapter nineteen the unexpected chapter twenty of the girl next door by augusta yule seaman aunt minerva takes command for an entire week thereafter aunt minerva went her own mysterious way calm and unruffled herself but keeping the rest of her family on tenterhooks of excitement she wrote mysterious letters which she would allow no one but herself to mail and received mysterious replies the contents of which she kept a dark secret they watched her with a feeling that they were quite outside the game now and that she had the keys of the situation entirely in her own hands which was indeed the truth at last one day after receiving a particularly bulky communication she denied to speak can you carry a message for me to miss benedict she inquired of marcia and janet yes they replied eagerly but humbly ask her if she could possibly grant an interview in her own house to the four of us here and one other it's very important oh aunt minerva you know she never receives any strangers in her house expostulated marcia i know that of course and you have told me the reason which i quite appreciate but there's bound to come a time even in her peculiar experience when it's expedient to break a rule like that the time has come now and you can tell her that i am sure that she'll be very sorry if she does not grant this request the matter intimately concerns her or i would not dream of intruding on her well you may tell us what you have been concocting minerva interrupted captain brett you've kept us in the dark about long enough haven't you and if i'm to go there in the procession i'd like to know a thing or two about where i'm at instead of sitting around like a dummy and who is this other one you allude to anyway miss minerva laughed at his impatience you may well ask edwin 
i think you must have been about as blind as a bat not to see right along what struck me the very first minute that you told me what the jigsaw things on the bracelet meant as soon as i heard the word amoy the idea jumped right into my mind about two months ago i heard the most wonderful address by a dr atwater a medical missionary from china whose headquarters are in the hospital in amoy and you can easily see that i thought of him at once when by jove thundered the captain striking his knee with the fist what a jolly goose i've been for not having to thought about the missions there at once i should say you were commented miss minerva caustically you and the major together well you see i've never come in contact with them much began the captain apologetically never mind that now went on aunt minerva i thought of dr atwater right away he's been there many years and he knows something about most everyone in that region i guess anyhow i decided that i'd get his address he's in this country on a year's furlough and write to him about this queer case and i did and he answered me and were you right they all interrupted i was so right she announced triumphantly that i asked him to come and tell his story which he has only outlined in his letter in full to miss benedict and i want you all to be there to hear it and what's more i'm not going to tell you another word about it until you hear it from him so it's no use to tease for hints go right in and ask miss benedict when she can arrange for this interview the sooner the better it was not an easy matter to persuade miss benedict to grant aunt minerva's request she was shy and timid about receiving strangers and her affection of the eyes as well as her curious manner of living made it hard for her to do so she had acknowledged that it would be even harder to see them elsewhere nor could she believe the affair really concerned her except very indirectly through cicely perhaps it was for cicely's sake alone that she at last gave a reluctant consent assigning the following wednesday afternoon as the appointed time and the intervening two days was spent by them all in a restless fever of expectation all at least except aunt minerva on wednesday afternoon dr atwater arrived at the apartment and was taken in charge at once by miss minerva who guarded him like a dragon lest a hint of the important secret should slip out before the appointed time he was a tall angular man with a gray van dyke beard and his face was grave in repose but he talked brightly and interestingly and had the jolliest laugh in the world the girls thought him very unlike their preconceived notion of a missionary he and the captain fraternized at once exchanging tales of the far east to which janet and marcia listened in absorbed wonder but at last aunt minerva was ready with the procession as the captain insisted on calling it filed into the street and proceeded to the gate of benedict's folly so unusual was the sight of the little crowd waiting to be admitted where no admittance had been granted in so many years that every passer-by stared at them open-mouthed miss benedict opened the gate bonneted and veiled as usual and marcia made the introductions as best she could to which miss benedict's replies were murmured so low that no one could hear them then she led the way to the house and into a darkened parlor where they all sat down with a sensation of heavy constraint after that cicely came in and was presented to dr atwater he started slightly when he saw her and looked into her face long and scrutinizingly in the dim light when miss benedict had removed her bonnet and veil miss minerva broke the silence miss benedict i have brought dr atwater here because i have discovered that he has something to tell you something that will be of intense interest to you i know this may seem incredible but i can only beg that you will do us the favor to listen miss benedict inclined her head without speaking and aunt minerva continued you have heard i believe about the curious incident of the bracelets but i do not know whether you have heard about the translation of the strange characters on them miss benedict murmured that she had not and miss minerva explained it as briefly as she could then went on dr atwater here is a medical missionary from amoy and i have found that he not only knew the owner of the bracelets but has some personal recollection about them that we think will concern you will you listen to dr atwater if you please miss benedict again bowed in assent and dr atwater began in an easy conversational tone 
Miss Brett has remarked correctly that I knew the owner of the bracelets, and all about the characters on them, and a good deal of the story connected with them. By sheer chance, or rather perhaps, I ought to say by very good reasoning, she has hit on about the only person living now who does know anything about them. Here's the story. A good many years ago in Amoy, I was quite a young doctor then, I was thrown in with a clever young fellow who had recently landed there, having come on a sailing ship from America. He seemed rather at loose ends, so to speak, didn't know the language, didn't have any money, didn't know what to do with himself, didn't have any occupation, and spent most of his time wandering aimlessly about the town. He was a fine, upstanding, straightforward chap. He said his name was Archibald Ferris, but he evidently had something on his mind, for he was gloomy and depressed. It began to worry me for fear he'd drift into trouble if he kept on that way, so I tried to get him interested in my work, and invited him to go around with me on some of my long tours. We didn't have any hospital then, and I had to go about from town to town doing my medical work as I went. He came with me very gladly, and was a good deal of assistance, and we grew to be firm friends. But I realized that there was something he was pining for, and after a long while he confessed to me what it was. He wanted a violin. He adored music, played well, but had lost or parted from his instrument in some way. He didn't explain that just then. Well, a missionary salary isn't beneficent, so I couldn't very well grant his wish out of my own pocket, much as I wanted to. The best I could do was get him in a position in a Chinese tea exporting house in Amoy, where he could earn the money himself. It was better for him to be regularly occupied anyway. After a few months, he had saved a sufficient sum and set off to Shanghai for his coveted treasure. He couldn't wait to get it over from America. After it came, he was actually happy for a while. He was a marvelous musician for his age, I'll admit, and he could hold a spellbound for an entire evening at a time with his bow. The natives adored him and gave him the nickname Chuck Gakalang, or Maker of Melodies. Well, he had the musical temperament, and after his violin came, he couldn't stay long in the tea house, but got to going about with me again on my tours, always with his precious violin. He was really of the greatest assistance, because his music was almost as good as an anesthetic in many instances, could calm the most excitable fever case I ever came across. It was on one of these tours that he met young Miss Cicely Marlowe, at the English mission in So Ke. At this point, everyone gave a little start of surprise and looked toward Cicely, who alone sat gazing wide-eyed and absorbed at Dr. Atwater. She was a wonderfully beautiful girl, he continued, with a color like English roses in her cheeks. The Chinese called her Flower Maiden, or Hor Lu, but she had recently come to the mission from her home in England. Well, it was a case of love at first sight on both sides, and before many more months, Ferris announced to me that he was going back to the position at the tea house and there earn enough money to be able to marry her. But he also told me that Miss Marlowe, while very much in love with him, was still very devoted to her work there and very earnest about the cause for which she had left her home and come so far to serve. She insisted that, if they married, she must still be allowed to continue in the missionary work. To this, he was perfectly willing to assent. So they were married in the English mission in Amoy, and on the wedding day he gave her this pair of bracelets, which he had made after his own design. They were not an expensive gift, but he was poor in worldly goods, and it was the best he could afford. After the honeymoon, they built a little home in the island of Ko Long Su, right near the city of Amoy. He went on with his work in the tea house, and she with her teaching in the mission school on the island. It seemed an ideal arrangement, and they were ideally happy for a number of years. He never advanced very far in the tea house, for he loved his music too well, and he had no head for business. But he made enough to keep them comfortably, and more they did not want. Then, about 1898, I think, came a change. To their great joy, a little daughter was born to them. She was a beautiful baby, and for over a year there was no happier home in all China. But one day, when the baby was about a year and a half old, Ferris came to me and told me that he was in trouble and wanted my advice. He began by telling me that the baby seemed to be drooping and that he himself was not feeling quite up to the mark. 
i looked them both over and found he was right the climate was too much for them it is for many foreigners sooner or later i told him that they ought to go home for a year or so and recuperate he said he couldn't didn't have any home to go to in fact had long ago quarrelled violently with his people and would never go back to them moreover he had his wife and baby to consider he couldn't afford to give up and lose his position if he did what were they to do i suggested that they go to his wife's people in england he said there was difficulty in that direction too she had only a married brother and his wife and they had not approved of her giving up all her prospects to come to china as a missionary they heard from them only at long intervals though recently to be sure that they had offered to take care of the little girl if the time came if she needed a change of air ferris told me that he and his wife naturally could not bear to consider such a thing but on the other hand the baby's welfare must be their first consideration what should i advise them to do i considered the matter carefully and at last told him he'd better accept the offer to care for the baby for a year or so she at least would be provided for and he and his wife could then take their chances without imperiling her future to follow this advice nearly broke their hearts but the next missionaries who went back to england on furlough took the baby with them and gave her into the care of the brother and his wife it is needless to say that cicely ferris is the same whom we know as cicely marlowe i would recognize her anywhere for she is the image of her mother and he looked towards the girl sitting in the dim light held by the wonder of his story the silence that ensued was broken first by her tell me if you please she half whispered did my father ever ever play to me on his violin did you know what he played why i'm sure he did smiled dr atwater i used to stop at his house early in the evening some time and i generally found him fiddling away by the side of your cradle mostly it was an air he called the troy marie or something like that i'm not very good at remembering musical names i knew it i knew i'd heard it somewhere over and over again when i was little she cried and yet i never could remember anything else about it he used to say it was his favorite remarked dr atwater suddenly miss benedict spoke for the first time during the recital there was a tremble of suppressed excitement in her voice is that all to the story oh no resumed dr atwater there's not much more to tell but i'm sorry to say the rest is not very cheerful after the baby's departure ferris's health failed precipitately he finally gave up his position but mrs ferris kept on with her work and nursed him as well but the strain of all this began to tell on her and at last in nineteen hundred i advised her to take a holiday and go north to tientsin with her husband to recuperate we missionaries raised enough among ourselves to finance this little vacation for them before he went however ferris had a long talk with me one day and confided to me a few things about himself and his past to begin with he said that archibald ferris was not his right name he had assumed it at a certain period of his life because he had broken away from his family and did not deem it best that what remained of the family should ever know he existed they probably thought him dead in fact he was sure that they did and his return to existence so far as they were concerned would simply complicate family affairs only his wife knew who the relatives were he had recently however sent word to his wife's brother that should anything ever happen by which cicely would be left alone she should be sent to america and placed in the care of this family whose name he had given them under a seal of secrecy if the brother and his wife were unable or unwilling to provide for her he also sent one of the bracelets to england to be given to his little daughter requesting that she be always allowed to keep it the mother always wore the other one he was very much depressed that day and told me besides that his career had been wrecked in the beginning that he had dreamed of being a great violinist but had been thwarted in strange ways however he declared that his life in china had been happy beyond words except for the unhappy present then he bade me good-bye as he was starting for tientsin that day dr atwater stopped abruptly and swallowed hard as if what he had to tell next came with an effort he went on presently it was at the time of the boxer uprising ferris and his wife had almost reached tientsin when the trouble broke out there and they were never seen alive again he stopped and there was a tense silence in the room at last he continued 
i have always blamed myself for having been the unwitting cause of their death i had advised them to go to tientsin though of course i could not foresee the dark days that were about to come i wish with all my soul that i had not done so that i had perhaps sent them somewhere else but it is irrevocable now there is no use dwelling on the past doubtless that is how the other bracelet came to be cast loose on the oriental world probably it was stolen at the time and passed from hand to hand till it came into the possession of captain brett it is a strange coincidence that brought it back at last to its mate it became my sad duty to notify mr marlowe of the tragedy in his reply a frank manly letter he expressed regret that a difference of opinion had ever interrupted the cordiality of his relations with his sister and her husband and said that as he and his wife already loved little cicely devotedly they would adopt her as their own they were reluctant to have her childhood shadowed by her parents sorrowful story and so believed it best that she should never know that she was not indeed their daughter cicely marlowe well that is the story of the man who called himself archibald ferris said dr atwater he looked about him inquiringly and added i hope that my telling it has given all the enlightenment that was expected during his long recital every one of them had sat with eyes fastened upon him and no one of his audience had a thought for the other now that it was all over each drew a long breath and settled back in their chairs and then for the first time they noticed the curious conduct of miss benedict she was sitting far forward in her chair her big gray eyes almost starting from her head her hands clutching the arms of the chair till the blue veins stood out on her forehead were great beads of perspiration and she drew her breath in little gasps quite unconscious of their united gaze she leaned forward and touched dr atwater's arm with an imploring hand was there was there no way of of ascertaining his real name she stammered dr atwater looked at her with compassion in his kindly eyes i know of but one thing that might have served as an identification he conceded when i was giving him the medical examination i noticed on his left upper arm two small initials surrounded by a tiny row of dots they were just such a mark as small boys often tattoo themselves with in indelible ink and of course they are there for life doubtless he had so decorated himself with his initials in his boyhood days oh what were the initials interrupted miss benedict in a stifled voice they were s b replied dr atwater with a little choking cry miss benedict buried her face in her hands oh it can't it can't be possible they heard her murmur then in an instant she had collected herself and gazed about them all amazement and incredulity in her lovely eyes my friends she spoke very quietly i cannot understand what this means my brother's name was sidney benedict and i remember when as a boy he had tattooed those initials on his left arm as dr atwater has described them and he performed wonderfully on the violin and dreamed only as being a great artist some day he longed to go abroad and study but my father would not hear of it he wished his only son to enter his business and continue it after him they were both high-tempered and had many terrible quarrels about it i my sister and i sided with my father at last my father threatened to disinherit sydney if he did not accede to his wishes and on the following morning it was his twenty-first birthday we found only a note pinned to his pillow saying he had gone away forever he had taken with him only his violin but and here she hesitated gazing around inquiringly on the company i cannot understand what follows two weeks later we received word from a steamer that had just arrived in europe from new york that a young man named sidney benedict had fallen or jumped overboard one night when they were two days out and his loss was not discovered till the next day only his violin remained in the cabin he was certainly lost at sea i cannot understand she suddenly pressed both of her hands to her head as if it pained her wait a moment cried dr atwater i believe i can explain that i should have told it before but i had quite forgot there was so much to tell he did once confide to me apropos of some little adventure we had had together on one of my trips when i almost lost my life 
that he too had once had a, the narrowest kind of escape from death he said that on leaving america he had taken a steamer for europe hoping to find the means to study there they hadn't passed sandy hook however when he became violently seasick and lay in his berth like a log for twenty-four hours on the second night it became so stiflingly hot in his cabin that he felt he must get to the deck for air or die so he struggled out and up on the companionway somehow meeting no one for it was very late on the deck he had crawled in behind a lifeboat and lay in a rather unprotected outer portion of the deck so sick that he scarcely knew where he was or how dangerous was the spot he had chosen all of the sudden the vessel gave an unusually heavy lurch and before he could clutch for any hold he was catapulted into the sea curiously enough the sudden ducking dispelled his horrible seasickness and when he came to the surface he found himself striking out to swim useless to shout for help from the great steamer which had already passed a boat's length beyond him but he was a strong swimmer and the night was warm and he resolved not to give up until he had to all night till dawn he managed to keep on the surface swimming and floating and at daylight a sailing vessel picked him up numb and weary and ready to go to the bottom at the next stroke the ship on which he found himself was bound for china and of course he had to tag along working his passage as a common sailor in return for his keep it was then i suspect that he made up his mind to change his name i think beyond a shadow of a doubt that archibald ferris and sidney benedict are one and the same person at this aunt minerva who hadn't spoken a word since her speech of introduction put on her glasses and swept the assembly with a triumphant gaze the girls and captain brett were so absorbed that they could not utter a syllable and miss benedict sat back in a chair in a stunned silence only cicely seemed unconscious enough of the strain to do the natural thing she rose from her chair and went over to miss benedict dropping down on her knees beside her and snuggling her head on the older woman's shoulder with a confiding movement i'm cicely benedict now she said simply and i-i love you aunt alexi i'm glad there was a good reason why i was sent over here to you miss benedict looked down at the golden head and the terrible tension in her face relaxed sydney's child my little cicely they heard her murmur but they heard no more for at this point aunt minerva arose and majestically motioned the entire company out of the room End of chapter 20. Aunt Minerva Takes Command. Chapter 21 of The Girl Next Door by Augusta Yule Seaman. Six months later. Janet, dear, I know you think I'm a wretch for not having written in so long, but honestly, things have been happening so fast that I don't have time to sit down and write you about one event before a brand new one has taken a place. I've missed you horribly ever since you went back to Northam it was a shame that you had to leave just after the grand clear-up of our mystery for you have been missing some of the most wonderful parts all the lovely things that have happened since i think i've already written to you about some of the changes that have taken place in benedict's folly it's the most remarkable thing the way aunt minerva has taken that place miss benedict and all completely under her wing miss benedict who by the way wants us both to call her miss alexi seemed completely helpless for a while after the great day and turned to aunt minerva for pretty nearly everything principally advice you can imagine how aunt minerva is enjoying herself she just loves nothing better than managing other people's affairs for them if they want her to in the first place aunt minerva advised her to get the house into livable condition and find suitable servants and get some modern clothes and poor miss alexi acted like a lost kitten in going about it aunt minerva just took hold and managed the whole thing and you would never recognize our dilapidated old house a mystery now it is so changed and so lovely miss alexi has decided that now there is no further reason for her not to use their large fortune and everything must be the nicest possible for cicely's sake and cicely what a darling she is of course we are simply inseparable she has even begun to go to the high school with me because miss alexi and aunt minerva has decided that it will be better for her than studying with a private tutor she is the happiest thing i ever saw and says that she feels if she were living in a fairy story all the time we are just longing for the easter vacation to come and your visit and then we three can be together in the good old way won't it be glorious 
but this is all aside from the other two big pieces of news i wanted to tell you almost from the beginning aunt minerva has been urging miss alexia to go to a first-class oculus and have her eyes examined and at last a few weeks ago they went together and what do you suppose is the result he said that almost without a doubt her sight can be restored with proper treatment and possibly a slight operation later she began treatment at once and already her sight is much improved she can stand a stronger light and has those awful headaches less frequently you see it was years since she had had any advice about them and they've made great strides in treatment of the eye since then they can almost do the impossible we are all so happy about it and now for the last and biggest piece of news perhaps you are wondering what has become of miss alexie's mysterious and invisible older sister and it is about her that i'm going to tell you you will never in the world be able to guess what has happened aunt minerva insisted again aunt minerva that miss alexi must have one of the big alienists that's what they call specialists in mental diseases i've learned see miss cornelia the sister and perhaps he could tell whether anything could be done for her it took a long time to persuade miss alexi that there was any use in doing this but at last she consented i think she has always been very sensitive about the poor sister's losing her mind and she never wanted anyone to see her even after she had a number of servants in the house she wouldn't let anyone wait on miss cornelia but herself well the great doctor came and was there for hours and asked a terrific lot of questions all about everything that had happened for years and years he learned one thing that interested him more than anything else he said do you remember the last day of summer when we were there sitting in the garden and i played on my violin how miss alexi came down in a great hurry and asked me to stop because it disturbed her sister you may remember too that i was playing the troy marie had played it twice well she told the doctor that when miss cordelia heard that she acted very much excited cried and twisted her hands and tried to speak she hasn't spoken an intelligible word since she had the stroke miss alexi also told him how their favorite brother had played so much on the violin particularly that same air he said this was the most hopeful sign it indicated that conditions were now such that there was a possibility of her reason and memory and even speech being restored provided they could touch just the right note of association after he had thought the matter over a long time he decided to try an experiment and he selected me little insignificant me to help he had me come in and bring my violin and sit in the room with miss cornelia a little behind her so she would not notice me particularly then he had miss alexi and cicely also sit there in plain sight of her just quietly sewing or reading and not paying any particular attention to anyone he and aunt minerva stayed outside watching through the partly open door it was the first time i had ever seen miss cornelia except that time when the shutter blew open and janet she is magnificent looking entirely different from what i imagined she is large and stately and imposing with white hair like miss alexi's piled under a lace cap and great black eyes she just sat there quietly knitting and took no notice of any one you would not have known that there was anything the matter with her except that her face was almost expressionless as if she wasn't thinking of anything at all i can't describe it any other way well there we sat and at a given signal from the doctor outside the door i was to begin very very quietly and softly to play the trombery you just can't imagine how nervous i was so much depended on my doing just the right thing my hands shook and my knees shook and my heart thumped and i thought i should never be able to even hold the bow it seemed an age before the doctor raised his hand as a signal but when he did i tucked the violin under my chin and fairly prayed that i shouldn't make a failure of my part anyway and i played the trombery through the best i could and nothing happened miss cordelia went right on knitting and never noticed at all then the doctor made another signal and i began it again this time she laid down her knitting closed her eyes and leaned her head against the back of the chair and when i'd finished for the second time what do you suppose happened she opened her eyes and looked over at miss alexi and spoke for the first time in nearly thirty years and this is what she said as simply and quietly as though all those thirty years had never elapsed sydney must have come in again i hear him practicing miss alexi was so startled that she looked ready to faint away but she managed to say no cordelia 
but i will tell you all about it then the doctor in great excitement beckoned all of us to come out of the room quickly and leave her alone with miss alexi so we vanished and the two were together a long long time at last miss alexi sent for cicely and she was gone a long time too when it was all over the doctor said it was the most successful thing that had ever happened in all of his experience miss cornelia is completely restored to memory and speech and after the first shock of learning all that had been blank to her for these past years she rallied well and is now resting and recuperating under the care of miss alexi and a trained nurse she still finds it very hard to realize all the changes that have happened in those thirty years and she grieves a great deal over the death of her brother which seems very recent and terrible to her but she is simply devoted to cicely and cicely is growing almost as fond of her as she is of miss alexi next summer the whole family is going with us to spend two months in northam aunt minerva's doings again because it is so lovely and restful there and won't we have a wonderful summer together janet dear i can hardly wait for the time to come well that is all the news i have to tell and i guess you'll agree with me that it is certainly enough and very satisfying one thing amuses me to pieces janet every time i think of it do you remember how when you first came to visit us last summer i was explaining to you all i'd discovered about benedict's folly and flattering myself with the idea that i or rather you and i would work out the puzzle and solve the mystery all by ourselves what little geese we were a lot we did towards unraveling any of that tangle even father and major goodrich were way off track it took aunt minerva the darling to walk right in and clear the whole thing up here's hurrah then for aunt minerva she certainly had the laugh on us however i sometimes console myself with the thought that it was we you and i who first took an interest in that shuttered old house in the garden if we hadn't who knows we would probably never have met cicely and things would be just the same as ever there and miss alexi wouldn't have but what's the use of going into all that the girl next door is our own dearest friend now and everything is all right i just looked out the window and saw a light in cicely's room she is also writing to you tonight. we promised each other we both would i'm growing sleepy now so good night and heaps of love marcia february twenty eighth nineteen thirteen p s did i tell you this before i wonder cicely has both bracelets now aunt minerva of course insisted that she should she has put them safely away and will never part with them again but we take them out and look at them sometimes and think of all the strange and awful adventures they have been through and the curious chance that brought them together again always after we've looked at them cicely asks me to play the tour marie and while i play she sits very quietly and says nothing and her eyes have a far away look but i know what she's thinking about m end of chapter twenty one six months later end of the girl next door by augusta ewell seaman